dealer has that and he'll you know he'll sell it borrow it or whatever that case might be but he's going to fulfill that order uh the way you look at the you know the way i look at the market is not necessarily is market overbought or or oversold right i, I don't use such concepts and not a lot of people do in this room um, and i'm okay if you use rsi whatever you want to combine it with the more confluence you have but sometimes when you do too much uh i think you can get the paralysis from analysis right where you're looking rsi is telling you one thing macd is telling you another ochimoku cloud is telling this and you're like, what the fuck's going on? I, I can't make two things together because one is telling me buy, the other one's telling me sell. Uh, honestly, the only thing that, that does matter is when you're in a market auction is the price being accepted or rejected, right? If people are accepting a price at a certain level and they're willing to pay that price, that means most likely the price is going to search higher, right? And if the price is being rejected, well, uh, we're not liking the price of a product at this level. Therefore, what is the price going to do? The price typically sells off in search of what? Buyers, right? You you have to bring the price of something so low uh, to, to for the buyers to step in. And in the quizzes that you guys took, right? Some of you guys were, you know, why, why does the price go higher? What does it search for? What does it, why does the price auction higher? So it's a random looking for sellers. sellers. Uh, shut off for sellers, sellers. Uh, to shut off the buying, right? You go higher to shut off the buying, right? You're looking for sellers where they're going to sell and stop, right? And as the opposite is true as well. When you're selling, why do we sell off? To shut off the selling. Yeah. You, I mean, you're, you're looking for somebody to come in and say, hey, this is a good price. We'll, we'll go and buy it here. Yeah. And, you know, there's different concepts that we're going to cover, right? Uh, you can't, some people are like, oh, the market profile is the holy grail. Market profile is based on time, but then you have volume, right? I mean, we, we covered multiple times. An auction without participants is not going to be a really healthy auction, right? And that's your volume. Volume is your participants. How many participants do you have at these levels tells you uh, if they're, you know, if they're involved or not in, in, in size. When you think about, you know, you know, going back on 4140 level that we just recently hit, it was a big level. I mean, we we went to all time highs from it. <laughs> we hit it, and there was a lot of orders sitting, and then people felt like, right, whether it was a you know a Christmas bonus rally for the big boys or not, they felt like they needed to buy, and they just kept buying, and we breached the all time highs previously at 08. Uh, and now we're kind of below it. And we haven't really seen a strong sell-off yet, right? Just going back to the current market, we haven't seen a lot of selling yet. This little pullback is, you know, maybe shake out some weak hands and then they, maybe they continue higher. And then we can use whether price was accepted or rejected using higher time frames, smaller time frames, right? And we'll get into it. But when the price is being accepted, for instance, if you look at the bottom left, you use the value areas of, of that breakout or the ranges to make sure that it's being respected. A range means just the high and the low, and the value area is the 68% of that volume of that range. Where is it? If you fall back inside of that, that means the price is not being accepted higher. Right? If you you know, if you're accepting it, once you come to the retest, like you see here, that means price is most likely going to be accepted to go higher, and we're going to proceed. Rejection looks a little bit different. You crack inside and you're not able to auction higher than that level previously because the sellers are saying, hey, uh, the value here is not that good. So then you auction lower until you find value where the people are going to come in. And you guys experience this daily in your life. How many, how many of you back in, let's say, was it 2008 when the gas prices jumped to like five, eight, five, four to five bucks, sometimes eight in California. How many of you guys looked up to see where the cheapest gas was? Or if they had well, gas. Well, everybody looks for something and every day you guys look for something, right? Whether it's bread or whatever you're buying, right? You're looking, maybe you buy it at the same place, irrelevant of the price because you like the person or people. But sometimes people look for the deals. They look and if the, the price is out of the what you believe you should pay, you're not going to buy it. <laughs> and that's how I look at the market. It's whether price is being accepted or not, right? Uh, when we bought, when I you know, initiated a long position in Pfizer, 
I posted on Twitter and a lot of people are like, man, you need to see a green candle before you buy it. By the time they saw a green candle, I was up 13% on my position. <laughs> and that's the opportunity part of the market, right? The opportunity comes if you're there, that's great. If you're not there, then you might have to wait for 13% and then you're going to wait for a pullback and then you're going to buy it. But that's the different mentality of trading, right? That's his style or whoever she commented on the post, but it stuck to me. It's like, okay, so you're going to miss 13%, but the value was here at 25. But value for me might be different than value for Cuban. Maybe Pfizer is not good for you know Cuban. Maybe he's going to wait for 16. But what if 16 never hits? I think 25 was fair then. What is Cuban going to do then? Well, Cuban is either going to have you know, an emotional buy where he's going to buy as part of the imbalance or he's going to sit, wait until it hits 16. Yeah. Uh, maybe he will get to see that. Maybe he will not. So the different people, different value, different time frame buyers and sellers, they determine what is their value. What's value to me and you on a daily might not be value to a longer time, longer time frame participant. They might treat it differently. Uh, we drew this, I believe, what, a couple of weeks back where you have, you know, how, how does it really work? You know, they place the bids, right? Then you have the offers, right? Somebody selling. And once they match the highest bid and the lowest offer, once they're matched, that's how you get a sell, right? That's how you get a transaction. You get a transaction. And then, you know, I'm adding some pieces and bits here in, in this class. But if you have a ask minus bid, what would you get? What does ask minus bid provide you? What type of information? Delta. Delta, yeah, exactly. Delta, it gives yeah. you the delta. So now you see everything that we do is related to really the transactions that happen. You're looking at the transactions and you're watching, right? So ask minus bid gives you the delta, right? And we look at the delta from footprints perspective to see are we getting an absorption? Are we falling down on positive delta like we did Friday? We had a couple of instances, right, where we looked at that or opposite, right? Remember, we were on NQ, we were bidding much higher. Me and Drew were on live, and we were like, man, this has to go to 50, at least 52 when it revisits. And it revisited 50, and it went lower than that, right? Because the participants were not in that auction, right? The big boys were not buying. They were selling while they were creating, you know, kind of a little bit of euphoria for people to buy their inventory, okay? Does this graphic make sense? Anyone have any questions? No. Okay. Okay. So I think we covered this slide pretty much, right? Uh, what what it does, and there's the famous peanut butter, right? Uh, dual action process that basically auctions up until there are no more buyers, right? And then it reverses down and moves down until there are no more sellers. Market moves up, shut off buying, and moves down, shut off selling. Can everybody conceptualize this? Because I honestly think it's opposite of most what most people think. Or is it not? I, I feel like a lot of people just uh, sometimes think of differently in a stock market uh, when they see these auction theories. Does everybody understand this? Can align to it? Well, you got to think like a do, wholesaler yeah. and not a consumer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that helps. It does, yeah. So, and you know, I give these silly examples, and I learned this from my teacher, what, like 25 years back in finance or more. Uh, she would give us these silly examples in complex finance, uh, and those are the examples that stuck in my head. So I figured if I give you guys silly examples, you guys will remember them, right? Yeah, we do. It's the same concept when you buy, whether it's peanut butter, whatever you buy. Just if like somebody, the, like somebody gives you Jiffy peanut butters at $20 a jar, are you going to be eating peanut butter that day? Probably not. Right? If you're used to paying peanut butter $4, a, you know, let's say at this uh, a jar, you're not going to be paying $20 a jar. You're going to wait or you're not going to just buy it at all. Right. And I've given you guys examples and scenarios, right? When I go to grocery stores, I take pictures. I don't know if you guys remember those. Uh, what was that fruit? Dragon fruit. Dragon fruits. 
when the COVID hit, it was two dollars, two for eighteen. Jesus Christ. And my wife was pregnant, if you guys remember. She sent me fucking dragon fruits. I was like, you know what? I'm not buying dragon. I'm telling her there's no <laughs> dragon fruits. Because if I bought it, what would I tell the, the, the people that checked inventory in the store? That you accepted it. That I accepted the price. Yeah, and I'm willing to pay it, $18 the for two. So what does that do for a person that can't afford it? Price it justifies the price. It's going to stay there because there's a buyer at that price. It's the same thing that you guys experienced with the cars, right? I would say uh, there's a person in the Discord. I, I think he might have Acne Man. Remember him? Yeah. Well, he, he was good with the cars, right? And he said that there was a Toyota RAV4 in California selling for $90,000. And I'm like, what? A Toyota RAV4? The little SUV that's like $35,000. If there's a person willing to buy it, <laughs> they're going to keep selling it at that price. So me declining to purchase and not accept the price of those dragon fruits at 18, then I posted a picture a week later. The, those same dragon fruits were two for six. Okay, well. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. I'm willing to pay $3 a pop. I'm not willing to pay $9 a pop. And when it comes to food, especially, you know, produce like that it's perishable <laughs> right so it's in their favor to try to sell at the highest price and then lower the price lower if you're in that business right they're gonna try to sell the apples at five dollars a pound and as the days go lower what do they do to the price they have to lower it to entice you to buy the apples yeah because they go bad they turn yellow unless they're sprayed with a bunch of shit then they stay green forever Okay, so the the idea is the market is going to do that, right? They do that constantly. If you just go and look at that, you know, when we say market auction is slowing down at the top, it's slowing down because there's not enough buyers willing to pay that, right? If we get new buyers and they, let's say, auction much higher than that, then your job is to wait for that level to come back to that level where they were and make sure that you're ready to buy along with them because they're going to protect that level, especially in the stock market, right? Yeah, retest and then go higher with them. And that happens a lot. It's just the patience of humans is not there. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so Shorty, market spun uh, mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Sure. So when they they saying uh, market moved up to shut up buying, is this shutting off? Like, so thinking of a uh, price ladder, uh, aggressive buying or just uh, passive buying or both? All the buying, right? Yeah, all the buying. Your, your limit buys are your, you know, it's your, if you're buying limit at those levels, somebody selling to you also be a limit, right? Most of those big sellers are sitting at the ask, right? Mm -hmm. uh, aggressive buying is also at the ask, right? That's why, you know, you can't look at ask and bid and say, yeah, this is a buyer, this is a seller, because it can be both on two sides. And we'll get to it in a second. So when they're selling, your job is, you know, to look for the moments where there's only one winner at the top. And then at the selling, there's no more selling at the bottom. We sold off everything we have. Yeah. So you're looking for a completion. A completed auction needs to happen. If there's a failed auction at the top, that means we have to revisit it to resolve it. Because it needs to be one winner at the top and one, you know, seller also winner at the bottom. Well, it's usually when you see a zero at the top and zero at the bottom. In footprints, you see a zero. In market yeah. profile, right, you see a single TPO. And we'll, yeah. we'll get to it, but we're jumping the gun a little bit. Uh, and then a volume profile, can you, you know, figure out if there's a – I showed you guys how before, but it's more subjective than TPO and footprints. In volume profile, if you have a skinny little line, it looks good. If it has a flat cutoff like a little cliff. That means it's a failed auction, right? So you can identify three different ways to see if that auction completed, right? And depend on what type of trader you are. If you're, let's say you're a scalper, do you really care at that time if the bottom of the daily that's 45 points away is finished or not? You might, but not really, because if you're scalping for four or five points, you don't care what's 60 points away, right? Especially if the true range of, a, you know, for ES has been running 30 points. 
you, you don't care. Yeah, we don't care. Right. But if you're an intraday trader, like most of us are, you look at the previous session and you see a poor high or a poor low, which is unfinished business, uh, and it's really close, well, most likely they're going to auction to it, sweep it, fix it, right? Have a completed auction. Then you're looking for an entry, especially if that you know poor low happens to be in a bracketed market and that poor low is below the value. Well, you want to be careful shorting at those times because below the value, what do you happen? What what happens when something is below the value? Price below the value, tend to reverse. They tend to reverse because they're gonna buy it up. There's people looking at it and they're like, "Man, that's cheap price." But it might not be the intraday <laughs> trader that thinks the cheap price. It might be a person that's a long-term buyer is gonna sit on it for twenty years. You don't know, right? It might be two years, five years, whatever that time frame is. But it's a different time frame person that's coming and buying or selling. So that's why we look at different time frames. And I saw somebody post, I think it was Meow Cat. Uh, like, why do we have a monthly level on our charts? Well, monthly level is there. So I know where's the monthly value area low? Where, because that level is fairly big. It's month worth of data. And most likely other time frame participants are going to jump in at those extreme levels. If you guys remember, on the extreme levels of monthly, weekly levels, that's where the long-term participants are sitting. Yeah, those are powerful, man. So yeah, if, we were back at December already. Yeah, so if you think about monthly value area low, like for December, or you know, December VPOC is somewhere on the bottom there, uh, I want to be aware of that level, not maybe because of today, but what if we are to drop off today to that level? And I'm not aware of it. And I short, let's say, 4140. Well, it was a three-year POC, and everybody and their mother thought that we were going to 4,000. But that level said, uh -uh, stop. This is a three years worth of POC. This is the fairest price we have. And what do people do when they meet a fair price? Just like I did. I bought the dragon fruits. I thought it was fair. I bought it. A stock dropped to a level. I'm going to buy it. Their job is to manipulate you to make you think that, you know, there's blood coming or that, you know, you're missing out. That's all they facilitate for you to be, because think about it, these big boys can't buy or sell, you know, between themselves. They do, right, to a certain extent, but they need who? They need the short-term buyers to absorb the inventories and selling and buying, right? So the long-term seller working with short-term buyers and sellers, the name of the game. A long-term buyer and long-term seller are rarely involved in the transaction guys so that large volume that they can exchange is literally sucked up by the small guys a million of us and we buy all 10 10 shares of amc what happens how many shares you buy a million no you buy a bunch and maybe there's not enough float for that stock to be bought up and then they have to do some tricks to get it right borrowing or what and that's what happened when people got into trading. Most of some of you on AMC and what's the other one? The got the name of it. Um, Dogecoin and you mean GameStop? GameStop, GameStop yeah. GameStop. I know yeah. the ticker, but I forgot the the name of the company. So and you know that that euphoria, and I've seen people where like, man, I'm up seven hundred thousand dollars, but I want a million, <laughs> and I'm like, what? You put in, you know, you put in twenty thousand dollars, and you're up. A million and you want you want more and what do you think happened to those people they're no what, longer what, 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 what. i know a lady who was in that exact position she wanted a million she was up six hundred thousand and she ended up closing out losing two hundred thousand jesus absolutely uh, stupid I, I just don't know how do you live with yourself honestly. no really that'd be very very hard to live with man oh my god I mean, that, that, that can, if you think, I'm not trying to be a financial advisor, and I'm not, right? But you take $700,000, and let's say you bought Pfizer at $25, all of it. You're like, man, I'm putting all in Pfizer. You should do some math and see how much dividends you could collect every year. Probably about $65,000 in dividends. You can live off of it, man. Oh, dude, you go to Cuba, you go to Colombia with $65,000? <laughs> And you live like a lord. Are you kidding me? No, I'm being serious. I mean, it was no. I, I know. I I sent a family member sixty bucks, man, and they eat all month over there with that. Yeah, 
And most people don't understand that, right? And I'm not saying go go move, but you got to appreciate until you move or see the country, yep. right? Well, let's get back on track. Uh, questions, check your knowledge. What are the two kinds of activity? Uh, don't make me pick you guys out. I don't want Cuba and then the regular Joe's answering. Meow, cat, new people. Don't make me go to Discord, please. Pick up people. Okay, I'll do that. Guys are... <clears throat> Let's see. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Odds. What do you think? First question. Uh, buy and sell. Anyone else? Okay, Cuban, you want to help? Passive and aggressive. Okay. Anyone else? Acceptance rejection. Long term and short term. Long term and short term. That's correct, right? Th those are the type of two activity, right? You sorry, sorry, I had to go to the bathroom. Man. Yeah, no worries. Uh, on the next question, I think I hope I explained it well enough. Uh, what is it? Shut up, buying. Uh, shut up, buying. Shut up, buying, and shut up, selling. That's correct. <clears throat> Market moves between what to what in order to facilitate trade? Balance to imbalance. That's correct. And how can we determine if it's long term trader or short term trader participating? Right, aggressive buying. Be careful. If it's a longer term uh, value area, if it's that's, 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 that's totally one of them. Okay. When you're well, outside the when you're outside of the two X IB range, uh, the, the, the idea. larger the larger longer term buyers and sellers are step in. That's what causes Those that. Those are very good points from all of you. So what does a long term buyer or seller seek? Fair value. Ooh, careful. Um, fair price. Unfair value. Unfair, yeah. Well, okay. I, I want to say. Unfair, pri I'm, unfair price, I should say. If I'm Apple and I want to sell as much as I can on my phone, I'm looking for news and frenzy where it makes it look like you can't get your hands on an iPhone. So I'm looking for advantageous price to sell to you. If I can sell it at 1600 do you really... Right, they, for the best price, yeah. They don't care if, you, if two people can't afford it. They care about the people that can't. And it's the same thing, you know, on buying, right? I was actually trying to buy a pair of Adidas Predator shoes that just got released. I was actually in Europe, and I missed it. They got sold off in 78 seconds. And then I went on eBay to look to see how much do you guys, the shoes are selling for $400. How much do you guys think it is on eBay? A thousand? Five Almost grand. like. What? Forty nine hundred Five grand? Five grand. Wow. Oh my gosh. So the opportunity was there, right? And there was people willing to buy at $400 and they fucking bought them all. <laughs> right? So long-time traders looking for uh, they buy, fair, they, fair yeah, price. They always, yeah, they always buy. At, you know, they below they buy below the value, right? And they sell. Their job is to sell above the value to you and make you feel like that you need that. And the short-time traders looking for price within the price range. Point. The short-term traders looking for fair price, fair price within the range. Yeah. That's correct. And when the price is stuck in, you know, in a range, when it's stuck there, that's that's called a market auction. That's negotiating process. If you've ever been to a market, flea market, or I don't know where you live, like Boston, New York, if you go to those, or Philadelphia has a really good one, uh, you go inside. Some people negotiate the price. This guy's like, I can do twenty dollars a pound for this, and this guy's like, man, can you do fifteen? The guy down there is selling for fifteen. You can experience this still, right? People are negotiating. Some people say, was it haggling on the price, right? 
I mean, if you go to a car dealership and you're like, hey, I want that car. <laughs> Uh, and you don't try to understand the price or put in a lower bid. How many? How many of you guys think that it just happens like that? I want that car. They go in whatever their ask price is, and they buy the car. How many of those deals do you think happen? Way too many. They do happen, but do you think there's also a negotiation aspect where a person? Oh yeah, like, for sure. Oh, like, oh always, yeah, always. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they uh, try to the sell you stuff. <laughs> Of course. I mean, you now, you know, I go for oil change with my forerunner. I go in there and the first thing that I'm telling you, I'll record it next time. I come in and a salesperson comes in. Hey, do you want to trade it in? And I'm like, yeah, of course. And they're like, oh, man, I, I see the excitement in his eyes. Like, I, I see it. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, great. I was like, I'll take the Sequoia Pro and it's priced at $90,000, 90 to 100. And he's like, yeah, we got the." I'm like, yeah, man, you love you have the one I want. <laughs> I get him so pumped up and he's like, all right, great. And he's like, we will offer you 36 for yours. I'm like, oh, I was looking more like 78. And he was <laughs> like, I, I can't offer you 78 for yours. I was like, I can't pay 90 for yours. I was like, I can do 56 for yours if you're giving me 35 for mine. He's like, man, I can't do that. And I'm like, I'm sorry, we don't have a deal. <laughs> I pump him up and then I bring him back to ground. So you're pricing your asset at some such a high price, but I can't price mine at such a high price. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the negotiation, right? And whenever they see me now, they just say hi and uh, we say buys and they know I'm not going <laughs> to <laughs> buy, buy their car at $90,000 because they added $5,000 of paint protection and window shield, whatever crap, worth five grand because that's pure profit, right? But my car also had that when I bought it, <laughs> but you don't value it anymore. <laughs> yeah. So when it's seeking value, it's a neutral day, right, Shorty? Always a neutral day. And then, you know, okay. sometimes you've seen it. We've had it happen two times last week. When the price breaks the IB on the high side, IBH, and breaks the IBL and closes inside, what does that tell you? Not accepted above. Well, that tells you decision. The market is not confident. Market doesn't have an idea where to go. They tried higher, we failed. We tried lower, yeah. we failed. Well, and, yeah. You know, 80% of the time, you're going to revert back to the POC. That's called the reversion to the mean. When you can't find the highs and the lows, you're going to be stuck to the POC. In short, you know, you're in control there, right? So this is what we covered so far. Short-term trader wants fair price. The best thing he can aim for is fair price because he's considered a day trader. A fair price is desirable for both sellers and buyers on a short time frame. Therefore, short-term buyers and sellers trade with each other. This is where you know a lot of times uh, I've heard you guys say when we're in a right range, I think there's a few of you that are really good trading the range. I'm really good at trading the range as well. And the problem starts when... <laughs> Uh, we break the range and you try to fade the, the breakout and you keep shorting, what happens then? Uh, keep getting you have a losing day. You have a really bad day and then you start doubting yourself emotionally and you're like, okay, but when you look at the market, you're like, okay, well, ooh, market's telling me that we're accepting the prices higher and, you know, if you guys remember, you know, I, I trade orbs. I traded orbs for a while. There's people on the floor <laughs> uh, that trade orbs using 30 seconds. Wow. They, de they determine the whole day based on 30 seconds open, 30 seconds that open, the high and the low of the 30 seconds. Yeah, I've heard <laughs> of people in 30 seconds, one minute. Holy shit. When you say the floor, what do you mean on oh, the like floor? The actual floor on, on New York. The trading the floor. floor. Trading oh, okay. okay. And, you know, when you think about us, we're a short-term trader, but there's a lot of shorter-time traders as well, right? And those are participating just as we are in the brackets, right? They, are, they find a fair price and they trade in between. A long-term trader, I mean, and you can see, right, I won't cover too many, you know, anatomy of market profile but when we see the single prints on the bottom or single prints on the top that's another way to tell us okay somebody else entered into the market 
And then if you see single prints in the middle of the profile, that's also somebody that's fairly emotional and aggressive buying. And we pay attention to it, especially when it's, let's say, a double distribution day, when it's a long B, right? That's being separated by single prints. We pay attention to it because that's somebody else initiating acceptance in the, you know, the top distribution. Are those called the other time frame buyers or sellers? Yeah, exactly. Those are the people, other time frame people stepped in and they drove the price between distributions from the bottom to the top or top to the bottom of spares, yeah. right? And we had the scenario happen when we were trading live. Remember, I explained uh, if we crack below this level, we're most likely going here. Yeah. And they happen often. Okay. And just make sure you understand the bottom, the tip. Does that make sense? Can you guys visualize that? If I was to just close your eyes, can you see that on a chart? Uh, as a homework out of this, uh, the bottom tip, I suggest you guys go back and look at the last three weeks. And you should find that this occurs a lot. <laughs> right? It, it happens a lot, and especially in the month of December, it happens a lot. Because, you know, long-term buyers, they either sell at those advantageous prices, right? And then we fall back inside, and the short-term traders take away, and they trade their value. Okay, we'll skip this. We cover this. Uh, the components of market auction theory, I, I believe most of you should be familiar with this, right? Time, pri time price, and volume. Uh, price is used basically, it's your discovery tool. And I think we can name thousands of examples of how you can use that. Time basically, you know, regulates the market. It's your opportunity. How many of you, let's say, how many of you wish you bought, if you had a million, you bought a million dollars worth of Pfizer at 25 and sold it at 30? Everyone. <laughs> the time was to buy when it hit 25, the value area low of a really long trend. If you sold at 30, you just collected how much? You oh, collected yeah. 20%, right? Mm -hmm. That opportunity and the time was there for a short period of time and it was gone. And then if you look at the volume, right? What did the volume do? Well, if you look at the candles, right? If you just look at the regular, you know, Japanese candles and you look at the volume, does it justify the bounce? Is there a lot of volume at that level? Did other time frame participants step in and they, are they part of this auction? And when we look at the time and sales, right? The other day, I believe uh, KJ asked a question in, in the chat where she said, when I look at time and sales, what do I pay attention to? Well, for NQ, I'm filtered usually above three, right? Because NQ has a lot of single orders, right? Now, I don't care to see a bunch of singles, right? Can those singles add up to a lot? Yeah. But I want to know when the guy steps in and buys 50, yeah. 100, yeah. 200. When I see those orders, I me and Drew were trading live the other day. Remember the 54 level on NQ? I, I can't remember the before numbers. Uh, yeah. But I know it was yeah. 54. Yeah. We saw I'm a huge sell, and then it popped, right? And I'm like, man, what is this guy doing? Like, it was 260 contracts. Drew's like, he got clapped. He was clapped for because he went like 30 points higher. Yeah. But is 30 points higher really something that's going to push a guy that just put in a notional value of a couple of billion dollars out of his position? No. Probably not. And that, you know, moments after, maybe 30 minutes later, he probably made a million dollars on that yeah. trade. But, it, you know, he knew his risk, he knew all the aspects, but, you know, the price at that level was good for him, the timing opportunity of that hitting, and the volume was there to confirm that level, right? When you combine those three pieces, that, that's where you get value, right? <laughs> uh, you really get the value based on all three components, and we pay attention to all three of these, uh, through market profile, through volume profile, and then the footprint shows the actual volume, the size, the bid and the ask, right? So I cover these. I kind of want to speed up to to get some of the more stuff, fun stuff. So the type of you know participants, I think most of you should know this by now. If you don't, you know, there's aggressive and passive buyers and sellers. So a quiz would be on what side are aggressive buyers show up uh, on the on the DOM or let's say on the footprint chart. 
on the ass. Aggressive buyers on the right and aggressive sellers on the left. Okay. And where are the passive buyers showing up? Opposite of that. So passive oh. buyers are on the ask. Is that correct? Yes. No. no that, that buyers on the question. on the bid, right? Buyers on the bid. I was just making sure everybody's on the same page. Passive buyers sit on the bid. Passive sellers sit on the ask. So you have aggressive buyers on the ask and passive sellers on the ask. And then you have passive buyers on the bid and aggressive sellers on the bid. Which Is the bid on the right or the no, left? bid's on the left. left. Bid's on the left. Okay, sorry. Yep. Yep. Sounds like you're dyslexic like me. <laughs> sorry. I think I like that too, man. <laughs> okay. No, I just want to I ask opposite sometimes just to make sure you guys are okay. So this is like yeah. So when you have and I'll, there's a slide, we'll get to it. Uh, you have aggressive buyers on the ask when somebody's buying at the ask. So think about it this way, right? And who's asking? Just so I remember the name. I am. Okay, trade. Uh, if I'm selling, let's say I'm selling my PC, right? And I have, I give you the details of the PC and I'm asking $3,000 for it. And you offer $3,000 for it. Is that an aggressive buyer or an aggressive seller? Aggressive buyer. Aggressive buyer. Yeah, aggressive buyer. Let's say the same PC. I want three thousand dollars for it, but you offer me twenty eight hundred, and I accept as a seller that price. And what type of transaction is it now? Aggressive. It's still seller. aggressive because you still sold it. That, that is it price. aggressive seller or aggressive buyer? So aggressive seller. seller. It's an aggressive passive seller. Buyer. Say it again. I'm just saying it was a passive buyer if he puts his price at twenty eight, and you have to well, come down to thirty. That's exactly. The, remember the first slide that we had? The highest bid price, lowest offer price. If the lowest offer for me was 3000 right, that I offered, but I accepted 2800 that makes me an aggressive seller. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And his highest bid was a 28. That makes him, you know, the highest bid on that position, right, for that individual. So that 3,000 PC, if I'm willing to accept lower as a seller, that makes me more aggressive. Just think about regular life. If you go on Marketplace on Facebook and you want to sell something from your house, if you guys remember the fridge that I auctioned with you guys, mm -hmm. the wine fridge, I, I put a wine fridge that had like 150 bottles of space. I put it for 50 and I could not stop the fucking notifications uh, on Facebook. Everybody messaged me a fifty because it was below the value. It was a five hundred dollar fridge. I'm selling it for fifty, and even the reseller saw saw the value. I'll buy it and sell it for two hundred, and he's gonna make one fifty. So what I did, I removed it from the marketplace, and a week later, I put it for two hundred. I still got interest, but not nearly as much. So, if I was to accept that fridge of fifty, that you know, if I ask 50 and I got 50, well, then fair square, right? Somebody got value and I got whatever I wanted out of it. Yeah. But in terms of stocks, right? If somebody's selling at bid, that's an aggressive seller. If somebody's buying at the ask, that's an aggressive buyer. Yeah. Okay. So let me show you the slide that might help with this. Uh, let me figure out how this slide go. Okay, here, here it goes. So do you guys remember this? Does this help traders? So now if you look, right, the left side is your bid, right? You can have an aggressive seller show up here, and like on the bottom or on the top, you could have passive buyers show up. On the right side on the ask, you have passive sellers, right? I want 3000 for that PC. Until you reach that price, I'm not selling. But then yeah. you also have aggressive buyers that drive up the price to get there, right? If NVIDIA say, I don't, we no longer are going to produce these graphic cards and my PC has that graphic card that's in demand, I potentially lift my ask from this price, lift it higher, and then you guys will have to chase and buy it. 
And that happens a lot, right? The old tape concept and people just lifting the offer. So you guys have to pay more for something. Does that, does this slide help? Yep. So now if yep. you think about it, if only aggressive buyers showed up on the ask, if only everything that we see on the right side was aggressive buyer, how easy would this be? Oh, I mean, man. honestly, the trading would be, <laughs> it would be a piece of cake. Yeah, we would be able to predict. You would see them, you would compare the price to the level, the volume, and you would be done. Yep. But even with this, we still have pretty good vision, right? When you compare, it's really the context of where the price is at that time. When you look at it, you're like, okay, well, you know, when that 54 order happened, we auctioned higher and then aggressively lower. So what do you think that guy did? <laughs> Or maybe it wasn't him. Maybe you know somebody misunderstood what he was doing, and they started buying, while while he was actually selling. Right. So on the bid, it's what you're willing to pay, and ask what you want to sell it for. But also at bid, if I'm selling and accepting lower price, I'm gonna show up on the bid. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. On the on the tape, right? When you guys look at the actual, let's say, L2 tape, right? On the aggressive buyer takes the liquidity from the ask. Does that make sense? Can everybody understand that comment? Yes. yes. Yeah. And passive seller provides liquidity in the ask. This is free asking for her shoes 104 dollars this is kj asking for her shoes at 105 and she has 720 pairs right at 106 cuban has 900 of something these are people providing liquidity on the ask they're passive sellers aggressive buyers takes up the liquidity on this side does that make sense yeah yes and a passive buyer provides liquidity in the bid if this product drops, you know, let's say if these oranges drop to $92, I'm willing to buy 90 of them. So now it's up to the sellers. Where is it going to go? Are they willing to drop the price that low to get it? An aggressive seller takes liquidity from the bid. So if I have a lot of liquidity to sell and I'm willing to, let's say, sell 50 at 99, then the price drops to 99. And if nobody's offering 99 anymore, what happens? Well, the price is going to keep dropping till a lot of these sellers are absorbed by the buyers. That's called absorption. And that's vice versa, if the price is... That's correct. And then if you think higher. about this, for the price to move down one level, sellers must absorb 50 limit orders. So if we oh. want the, uh, the price to go down, these sellers might they have to absorb these buyers sitting there. Once they absorb them, the next one's a 98. And mm. then the selling stops off, right? Where would the selling stop? How does the selling stop? When, there's no when you go past 92. When the aggressive sellers on the bid are absorbed by the limit buyers on the bid. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where you have typically a completed auction. Does that, does that make sense? That again, uh, shorty, again. So if I want to go down, if the price is to go from 100 to 99, these sellers must consume these 50 buyers at 99. Gotcha. Once they consume them, then the price is going to be 99 or low. Unless there's a market participant that comes in with market orders and starts absorbing the liquidity from these ask on the sell, sell side. So these are sellers. These are buyers. Market people are not on the tape. Does everybody understand that? Yeah, but they're yeah. on the volume, right? They are on the volume, but not on the tape because we right. don't know where they are, right? I mean, it's an emotional buy, I would say. I want it right now, right? Uh, right, right, right. If I want to buy right now, I'm not planning that buy. I, I'm planning to do it right now. Whatever yeah. that offer is, I'm going to buy it now. I don't want to wait. Market buy. Market buy does that, and they, they don't show up on here because we don't know what they want to do. Right. <clears throat> okay. I don't know. I put it all the way back. Okay. Let's see. 
that we stopped here, right? So th this is really important for you guys to understand when you're if you're trading value, right? I trade a lot of value, and it's important you guys understand it. Responsive activity is effective behavior, right? When market breaks down below the value, buying is expected. When the market breaks above the value, selling is expected. And that's fairly simple, right? And when you combine this slide with the slide where we say, where do we open in relationship to the previous day? <laughs> it, it starts clicking a puzzle on how you can trade some of this stuff. Initiation activity is unexpected, right? And this is where a lot of you guys suffer. And not that you suffer because you don't understand this bullet is because the emotions take over your logical reasoning uh, and, and you guys do the opposite. Right, and that's what I mentioned earlier. When you have a range and the IB is being broken and you're still fading and shorting that move, that's when you get in trouble, right? When the markets break below the value, right, selling is unexpected, but initiate initiative sellers step in and they they go aggressive. When market breaks above the value, buying is unexpected, right? Who buys above value? Long term trader. It would be a long-term trader that perceives Retail. that value. No, well, not necessarily. You could have a long-term trader buying above value because he's not a day trader. Maybe he's looking for three years from now. Yeah, or other, t other time frame. Yeah. And that's why we have to use sometimes different time frames and levels to figure out who's engaged. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. On the balance, right, in balanced markets, it's basically they're agreeing on price. These are your high volume nodes and volume profile. You know, if you were to visualize a volume profile, wherever you have a little fat area, that means that people were happy trading there. Yep. When you see a low value area, what does that mean in terms of interest at that level? Not much interest is going to fly right through there. It's going to fly, right? So usually low volume areas are imbalances, right? Those areas, you know, when you have a low volume area, right, or an imbalance, sometimes when you guys go on the footprints, what do we look for on those imbalance candles? On the footprints? Yeah, on the footprints, when you have an imbalance candle, what, what, what do I look for? And, you know. It worked like five times on Friday. Like high volume on either side of the candle? I look for the actual imbalance of orders on the footprint to see where did the imbalance happen. Where was that aggressive buyer that stepped in in the middle of that low volume node? Remember those stacked zones when it highlights three zones in a row on the footprint? Yeah, we usually get a, yeah. Yeah, we usually get a highlighted zone there. You get a highlighted zone, usually happens in an imbalance when you had a balance and it triggers an imbalance and we wait for price to come back to those imbalance areas to go long or short, depending on how price went, whether yeah. it went up or down. Right? And it actually yeah. happened multiple times Friday and I would say it worked every time. Yeah, they tend to go a little bit past and then go. Uh, that's always what you wait for. You let yeah. them dip, they reclaim and then they pop. Yeah. Right? But when, when you have an imbalanced market, buyers and sellers that are not in agreement. That means they disagree, and whoever, wherever the price is going, that's the aggression, right? If you see a lot of orders executing on the ask and price is going higher, well, it seems like and delta is positive, right? When you do the ask minus bid, that would mean that one of the side is more aggressive. In that case, it would be the buyers, right? Okay. So this is kind of what it looks like, right? If you think about balance, right? This was our range high. This is your range low. And here you're in balance three days, right? One, two, three days in balance. And look what happened. The balance range high, you broke it, right? You see the volume here is above average. The blue line is your average. We broke above it. And what yep. did they do shortly after the next day? Came back to the uh, point of uh, resistance and went higher. Retested the value, retested the high. So something like, yeah, acceptance. Yep. It, it, 
they accepted the price to go higher. The new, the new value, yeah. So when you think about this, if they accepted the price higher, honestly, if you come here and you, you know, here they didn't have a lot of volume at that time, but if you place an order here and you find a decent stop loss, let's say below the mid back of this candle or whatever that setup is that you're looking for, if you look at this, this is not a bad, you know, breakout. Some people wait for opportunity to buy on a breakout here, right? And that would have worked out. But this is a typical an example of balance to imbalance and price being accepted higher. So it covers that slide that I just went back to pretty good. Your imbalance, three day balance, you had, you know, your value area high was somewhere around here, probably value area a little, a little bit higher. We reclaimed that, we popped higher, came back and retested and higher prices went over. Yeah. More buyers stepped in and they continued, more aggressive buyers stepped in and they continued. Okay. Any questions so far? So we, I would say with this, we concluded the market option theory that, the idea of it, how market operates. Is there any questions on this? Hey, hey uh, Shorty, quick question on this one. So there, there was after the three days, the fourth day it broke out above the balance range high, right? Uh -huh. So would you say that acceptance is the next day after you retest that? Or would you say it is on the fourth day that there is acceptance? So the fourth day they did not fall inside back the range that telling me that there's buyers still that they're still aggressive and mm -hmm. if you're to look at this candle it closed right at the poc of that day it's a p-shaped volume profile if this candle let's say we went up and we auctioned and we fell back inside below these volume nodes that would be concerning for that day to conclude what is the message right but they closed in the top of that candle right on top of the poc then they did a typical move. What they do is they go below and on the P shapes, you're looking for high volume nodes to bounce or they, they can protect the low volume nodes. So if you look at this candle, I don't even know what Friday, October 6, we could go back. You most likely find that there was an imbalance, an aggressive buyer sitting here and look what happened. They came back and they defended it. This is the day where they defended this position and the breakout of this range. And this is the acceptance for prices higher. Okay. Gotcha. Here is another typical behavior, right? This would be a prior day high and people would get in here on a breakout of this, right? And they gave them a breakout, but they also gave them a scare shortly after. Yeah, so They started sure consolidating immedi immediately right above it, right? And then they proceeded higher. They gave them a few traps where they put in a lower low, then mm -hmm. they put in a lower high, higher low, that's immediate consolidation. And then they gave them another trap with the lower low. So they shook out any week buying here right that had closed stops they took them out and then they ripped again that's kind of how i would look at it okay it's yeah, much thanks. easier for me to buy and at this point especially if there was an imbalance than to buy here i i don't know how to buy breakouts that, that's just not i don't know how to do it i i can't click buy when they're breaking out because the price discovery mechanism I don't want to be the first one to buy this product at this price. Same as when it first broke out right there before the retest, the long candle. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, if you think about this, this one to me is much more probable breakout than this one. Does anyone know why? Between the two, why would I trust this one over that one? Biggest multiple day balance. That's one reason. What's the second reason? It popped up above the it's single well, volume. Volume. And yeah, look at the tail. And look at the tail. On the day of the breakout, you're also in a P shape, which tells me you did not want to spend any more time where? I don't in know. the value area. <laughs> in the three day balance, you're done with it. You yeah. came back to the bottom, you have single prints. I know maybe you can't see them, but you have single prints on the bottom. You're not spending much time at all here. You're in a rush. They're in a mm -hmm. rush to get out of here. They got out of there. They confirmed. And yeah, that's very aggressive uh, buying there. Yeah. And if you look at this lowercase b, is this a long b or a short b? Well, it's a short lower b. Lowercase b. It's oh. a lowercase b, and it's a, it's not an elongated profile. There's not a lot of liquidation happening at this point. 
usually when you have a lower, like a lowercase b and it's compressed, those are used for traps. And same can be said when you have a p shape that's compressed, not elongated, those can be used as a trap for upsides. Okay. All right, well, the fun starts here, right? So if you're not familiar, is there anyone that, that's okay if you say yes, don't be afraid in this Discord or to say, has anyone ever not used volume profile? I am a very recent user of volume profile. Say it again. I'm a very you know, new user of volume profile on futures. Okay, good. Anyone else? Meow Cat, was that you speaking? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and I can tell in the room who, who understands it because you, you know how else I can tell? Besides you guys posting charts, and when you guys comment about RSI and MACDs, I immediately know you're not using volume profile. I'm sorry? Without it, you're blindly trading. I, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> so once you understand the volume profile, and let's say market profile, which hopefully I would say, we, when I started this room and you know teaching people, I started with volume because it's easier to understand the market profile, in my opinion. Uh, you know, we've covered volume profile for a while, and I would say majority of the room, I would say 70% knows how to trade volume profile. Then we added market profile, and it took us, I would say, about three months so far to get people up to speed. They see the letters and they freak out. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. And it took people some time, and now people are getting more comfortable. I hear comments on live, single prints. I see this period. I see IBABs. But you guys are starting to kind of put it together, right? And it's not an easy task, right? It's almost two different languages. One is based on time. One is based on volume and price. And they have different anatomy, right? They use different language. And, and typically, they, I would say that they have the same message between the two. The same principles apply, right? Uh, the only thing the market profile does, the way they structure the data, gives you a little bit more information uh, regarding the day or the time that you're trading it, whether it's framing down or up, whether you have single prints, other time frame buyers, sellers coming in. Uh, you can still do initial balance. We've always done initial balance in volume profile, but now you can use letters A and B, to the, you know, instead of the 30 minute candles, right? Two 30 minute candles. Those are the different nuances, right, that, that it provides, but it does give you a little bit more ammo on, on the market generated information. Volume profile is still, I would say, uh, my baby. <laughs> I use volume profile a lot. And you guys see me charting with, you know, FVP, fixed volume profiles a lot when I'm looking at data, see where are the bounces, you know, where did they pop from or where was the balance to imbalance, where's the POC value areas. All of that matters. Like on Friday, I mentioned that we were at the value area high, that it wasn't a bad short. And shortly after, that was 18 points. Right? We tried multiple times. You're auctioning and uh, you fail. And that's how I use volume profile. And you know, we'll go into details. But it's the same simple concepts that, that you can apply in market profile. It's just that it gives you more information at that time uh, that you can combine with volume to make a conclusion for your trade. Okay, so what is volume profile? It's similar to what you guys have seen before on the bottom, right? Where you have the candle and the volume, but this one tells you how much volume at that price did we do? How many contracts exchanged at that level? And you might be like, okay, well, who cares? Well, you should, because if you exchanged a million contracts at price of $10, and now we went to $15, well, that $10 was the point of accumulation for them. And if you were to come back to that level, most likely they're going to defend that position. Right? Uh, the components of volume profile, so the point of control or POC, right, is where the highest amount of volume has been traded. If you're selling a product at a price of $10 and you have the highest number of sales at $10, that would be the fairest price you have for that product. If you increase the price to, let's say, $12 and your sales go down, what is the market telling you? Price is too high. It's too high. It's too high. 
And when you think about volume profile, all the volume profile does, it tells you those levels using, you know, I would say the bell curve, the standard deviations, a little bit of statistics. Where is it? If we are trading happily, I'm just going to go next slide. If we are trading happily within the first standard deviation of 68.2%, that's what we change it to, you know, value area high is just the top of that skew on the first standard deviation. The bottom is the value area low. This is where short-term traders live, right? They trade in between the value and the big boys are usually selling from above or buying from below. Like I guess in this example, they did the same. Yep. They bought, they sold, and then look in between is me and you guys, unless you're a different type of uh, trader. In the POC is where they were happiest, right? So if you fall back inside the value, where are you most likely to go to? It's the POC. Uh, yeah. And we, we have the setups in the PowerPoint. If you guys remember the slide when you have a range and then you have the value, when you reclaim the value, you're targeting the POC as a first target. Once you pop that, you're going to the value area high. Value area high. Target. Yeah. So your value areas where, you know, uh, some it defaults to 70%, might change mine 68, where 68% of the volume for that day where it traded. So it's important to know that because if 68% of the volume is here, that means what the other what 32 percent is above or below so naturally the price is going to navigate towards the fair price or equilibrium anytime it gets back inside that value the 68 percent okay uh you know when you go from the bell curve aspect right and understanding this if you haven't taken any statistics Everything usually falls in within the first standard deviation. The other two become anomalies, right? When you're stepping out to two sigma, three sigma, you're already reaching for the stars and it's too far away from the equilibrium. And most likely the price will eventually navigate towards that price where it was fair and where a lot of volume existed already. Because if there's not a lot of liquidity on the outside of the 68%, is there a lot of reasons to trade there? No. Oh, it's going to be quick and dirty. They execute the orders that hits, whether they print single prints or not. And then eventually the goal is going to be to go to the mean or higher, especially if they bought it at the lower prices. So the cycle repeats. They bought it below the value. They're going to sell it above the value. Buy low, sell high, right? That's the concept in the value area. Uh, you have the concept of high volume nodes and the low volume nodes, right? High volume nodes is where there's a lot of participation, a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of trades happen, right? Uh, they are true support and resistance. If you, you know, we trade that a lot, I would say, when you have a high volume node and then the price comes back to it, uh, you can, you know, depend on if it's a long or short. If you broke out of a, you know, uh, zone, let's say consolidation zone, you popped higher, finding those high volume nodes for a retest is really good. Yeah, support and uh -huh. resistance. 4140 that we had the bounce from was a really high volume node. It was a three year POC, which makes it a high volume node. And once we came back to it, I mean, you got 700 points from it. a low volume node, it becomes a little tricky, right? Because a lot of people treat it, oh, low volume node, as soon as you enter in there, it's going to dump. Somewhere in there is also an aggressive buyer or seller that they initiated that imbalance. And typically, when I say we're going to protect that low skinny belly, right, uh, they, they're sitting there to make sure that the price doesn't fall inside that low value area because there won't be any trading that occurs. The price is just going to, like we had on Friday, on Thursday's watch list, we said if it breaks 27, then most likely it's going to hit 03. So they usually protect it pretty good too. And they will protect it, but if it falls inside, Yep. There's not much volume or participation to stop it until it goes to the next volume load. Yeah. 4703 was our, I believe, a POC or a VPOC level that we had. And it was yep. also the end of the, of the single prints on the market profile. Yeah, it was. We, sure. we lost 27 and, you know, we lost at ETH, right? And we had two scenarios. Either we were going to bounce there or it was that they were going to go to 40, what is it? Uh, 40, no, I don't even know what it was. 46, 46 81 or 
No, it was ninety six. There was a VPOC there or ninety seven that they're gonna trap the you know the longs. Oh yeah, uh, shorts below it and then bounce from there. But they elected from forty seven and I mean they ran at what like almost fifty points, which we said if they comes here that they can go to the PD value area high. And remember they they cracked that fifty was it forty six seventy five on ES, then they cleared fifty four. Yep. The only other level that was left was sixty six. And they, they tapped 66, which was the PD value area high and from there, the auction lower, right? And they closed right at the the spike base. Well, they tapped 60, shorty. Oh, six, sure. 60, they tapped, the, whatever, it was 60, 66. Yeah. They tapped it, and that was a PD value area high. I know they yeah. completed the 80% rule perfectly. And oh, yeah. They continued lower, and they found it in the middle somewhere. On the volume profile, whether you're using, it really doesn't matter the platform you're using. The, most of these platforms now offer same features, right? Uh, fixed range, I like trading view because it does have the flexibility of fixed range, visible session volume is day to day. And then PVP we use to find whether it's weekly, monthly, quarterly, or yearly profiles, we use PVP. Session volume profiles, we use a day to day, right? Just to see. Are we progressing? Is the auction still healthy trend? Is it in balance? Are the value area shifting or POC? Uh, we use that to establish the, the bias. Then the visible range, uh, some of you guys see that on my quant tower, right? When I trade, I have the either volume profile using volume, or sometimes I have the delta on the right to see where is the aggression uh, for cumulative, uh, whether it's all time visible range or if it's 10 days or seven days weekly, you can adjust that visible range as well, whatever is visible on your screen. And then you have the fixed range. This is used by me or members in here, but we have a consolidation and then you have an imbalance. We grab the low and the high of that swing and we look for the volume nodes where they can come for a retest. And typically, you know, when you find a fixed range, you want to play, I would say, unless you're in a, a balance more than two days, I like to use fixed range to find where are the buyers or sellers on that imbalance move. If they're reaccumulated somewhere, like 4,700 was a reaccumulation of buyers. If you guys go back on your visible range profile, they were there. They are sitting. And I'll stop here for a second and show you guys. Let's see. Uh, let's hide this. So, and you're right, they did tap 66, but that was on Thursday, surely. Yeah. So yeah. now if you guys look, right, uh, we had that October low, whatever this is, I unadjusted, 41.21. Uh, we tapped that. So if I was to take this fixed volume profile, and you guys can find this here, fixed range volume profile. I think you can go under indicators, technicals, profiles, and then there's also here, fixed range volume profile. If you click this little favorite button here, It'll give it to you in the favorites, like here, and then you can just click it easily. And so, if I was to select this low to let's say this high, I'm able to see where all the volume nodes are, right? So, now if you guys think about this, where did we bounce, right? Uh, on this level here, well, we bounced somewhere around this level, which happens to be you know the last piece of the node. Tronic. So if you look at this, there is a volume node that, that's stopping there. And then look at this one here. This was a tiny one on the 4,700. And we talked about this, right? So if you look at it and you zoom in a little bit, look at this. <laughs> this tiny little guy here was enough that it created, right? A tiny little volume node. And this is the bounce that came there. Is this a typical node that offers a drastic bounce, I would say it can, right? And it did. But where would you expect the buying to to be set? Is if you look at this, it's right here. If we were to come to this level 4564, and I typically look at these high volume nodes and I kind of scan, okay, well, where is the area where they can go? And this would be something that I look for. So now if we are to lose this 4700, what would I expect? I would expect us to go to 4564. A lot of people that are afraid to short here, where is the retail most likely going to short? At the bottom one. Yeah, 4564 level. 
they're going to come here and they're going to start shorting right here. And typically, this is where I start buying. buying. Yeah, because yeah, that's retest. As they're selling here, I'm going to buy. And the people that shorted here are most likely going to cover at this point. Right? Yep. As they're covering, that means you're covering to buy. So they're yeah. helping with the delta positivity. They're buying. The dealers also here are selling to the buyers. And these people that are you know, short selling, they're all you want to sell sure sell the majority are going to buy to defend the position from here because this is our balance market goes from balance to markup to another balance so whether it's a reversal or a continuation right and you can look at that on daily right and you would see it pretty nicely so if you think about this we had the nice 4140 level and i would say let's see 21 even if you grab from covid lows uh, here's your bounce. It came back. It hit perfectly. The value area high was, you know, offering some resistance here, 46.5, and then they popped higher. So now, if you look at the daily, you can see where the consolidation happened. And you know, for a lot of newer people, this is where the struggle might be. How do you know where we consolidated? I mean, you, you can literally hide the candles here. <laughs> Just give me the point where where to start, and I, you know, I, I don't care about anything else. Start your volume profile here, and I would end it here. And you can hide this. Yeah, you can see it right there. If I start this now from here to here, <laughs> wow, this is all, this is all I care for. I know that this is going to be the level that I'm interested in. And as the price comes to this level, I meant to take this line, this would offer some support. And this profile is not, I would say, not the healthiest buying profile. The value is way below at 4,600, 4,608. It's a three-year value area high. So there's a lot happening in this area as we come to it, right? And uh, you have to change your behavior and how you buy and sell. A lot of people like to go with the flow and that you become more of a market participant, aggressive market buyer and seller. Instead, when you guys think about that bid that we had, uh, the chart, right, where we had the bid and the ask, right, you can use that to become one of those guys on a longer time frame, right? Whether it's L2 that shows you up on 10 levels or L3, you'll be able to see it. Right, where where are you sitting? Right, I would expect buyers to come in here and defend the position. Right, right now it's just a negotiating process. What we're gonna do? They still have a little bit of volume here, but it's not necessarily a, you know a lot. This level here will be a decent buy level for a long, let's say, call or whatever you might consider. It would be a great level, just like this one was here. Is that forty five uh, fifty or forty five sixty? It's 64. Yeah. 64, yeah. Okay, got it. And that's how I would use, you know, the volume profile and then the visible range that you guys are seeing here. So you can go under indicators, technicals, profiles, and there's something called visible range volume profile. I already have it here customized. For, and you guys see it now, right? If I was to, you know, I'm zoomed out here on daily, right? You see where the volume is. If I include, you know, I'm including in this visible range profile, let me just delete this. I'm including, let's go on a weekly so we can add more data. So right now I'm including data all the way from December 17th. And this wow. thing on the right, if you guys can see it, is producing volume profile based on what's on the screen. And you see mm -hmm. now, you know, the POC in this case, the mean, the fair price is sitting at 2,700. Uh, so at, at this point, if you're a bull, <laughs> you would be a new bull, right? You would be considered new money and you need to kind of defend these levels. But this, you know, ever since we left here in March 20th, right, we haven't really been back to this level here. And then when you go 2008 to now, you're sitting at 1300 and we haven't been to that mean ever since. <laughs> okay. And some people say, well, consolidations can't happen long periods. Well, sure. Like if you look at this data, for instance, right here, this is where we consolidated for a very long period of time. 
But if this was the consolidation of, you know, from 97 all the way to here, maybe this is the result, right? Can this not be the markup? Well, yeah. if this is the markup, and now we are sitting right here. Yep. <laughs> and doing it again. We accepted the prices. Let's say we didn't accept the prices higher here. I mean, even if you use Wyckoff and the other theories, there's a high chance you're going to be coming back to the mean again of this consolidation, right? So yeah. let's say you get back inside and you draw this, and that was your 41, whatever, 40 level. Now you can dissect this chart a little bit, right? So this was our high right here. You're back inside this range. You're not able to break it, right? And what we learned earlier on this break, you, you, you don't want to be this guy right here. You see this little fella that bought mm -hmm. right here with the wick? Uh, you don't want to be the price discovery. If they're going to crack out of this right first, we need to see the volume, right? We need to see the volume, the breakout right here. And I would say the volume, eh. Not so crazy on the breakout. So we need to see this level broken down with a lot of volume. And then when they come back to it, this is where it would be a really good long for potentially long-term timeframes. Let them explore prices higher. And when they come back to this level of the breakout balance, then it would be a potential for a long. But now on a long time frame, when I analyze this, right, this is my value area high. This is my value area low. I would say, what, three years? or so if you're able to if you are to lose this 46 let's say 14 if that's the level here let me make sure yep somewhere around that I thought it was 46 or eight yeah that sounds much better if you're to lose this level let's say you get back inside the principle of volume profile would say what Gonna visit the park at least. If you are not accepting the prices to be higher, where do the advantages? Where do the long-term people buy it? At the point of control. There's a point of control, which is our first target, right? If you're That's short, very, very you want to be short below 4606, called 80% rule, and you can trim your position at POC. You want to close it here. If we are to come back here, right, to the value area low, you would have buyers here. There would be instant buyers here. And if these prices were, let's say, to go lower here and they crack below this range low that was set here, then they reclaim it. Oh, my God. This can quickly go to all-time highs. And that happens a lot, and it happens on five minutes, and it happens on every different time frame that you guys potentially trade on, right? So if you think about it, uh, if this was our range, let's say you see this low here. Uh, I think this was the open. No. Let's say this low here that was set. You guys see it? They came back here to the low, <laughs> and then what did they do to the poor people that shorted? Did they crack this low? Did they make a lower low? Yeah. Trap. Put in a lower low. Orders. They trapped all the shorts and then they popped immediately. And I would say if you were to grab this area right here, they went right to the POC of that sell off there. And just so you know, I, I don't I don't ever count this level as a single level. This would be something that I would do all the time. And it typically is a couple of points, right? Left or right. And you see here, they came, I would say, a few points away from that level that we had. And that's just using, I guess, uh, five minute candles here. And here's your POC. And look, they came very close to that level for potential sell off, right? So where's the open? Let me go to our TH. I don't mess with this. Okay, so here's Thursday. Where's Friday? Why is it not giving me a damn line on Friday? Okay. Well, maybe it doesn't want to. I don't know why, but 
Let's see. Friday open is, well, I guess that's it. About five minutes. So this is where we open, right? And this was our open low here. The blue lines are open low. We spent some time below it, right? That was the low, they cracked below. Then they went below and they consolidated again, right? And then they popped out of it. Was it aggressive pop from here to here? In my book, I would say that's yes. not aggressive. Uh, but why do I say that? And it make a higher high. Thank you. There was a supply here that we, so Texas Raj, if you look at this, this was a supply. This was a consolidation again, and look what happened. We consolidated, you know, we sold off. And on smaller time frames, you could make a case for more consolidations, but the more you go lower time frames, the less probable your setups are. <clears throat> so in five minutes, you consolidated, you sold off. So if I was to look at this sell-off candle from the top, let's say to the to this candle here, where's the POC? Is it right here? Where did we sell off again? <laughs> again, you sold off from here. And then similar concept, right? If you were to grab this to here, and there goes that POC, I think that's the one we had earlier. You came very close, right? You would draw a little box around. And is anyone challenged when I say draw a box around this? POC, is there anyone? Anyone? It's, it's more subjective, but the way I look at it, I look for symmetry around it. I look to see where's the kind of cliff fall off. You see clearly there's a cliff here, right? Shift yeah. volume. Yeah, when you draw the box, it's easier to see. And when I do this, to me, I look, you know, it's, you know, two and a half above, two and a half below. I look for symmetry and that, I don't know, to me, the brain just does it automatically. I, I don't really think about it that much. And now this would be the zone I have to reclaim, right? So if I was to draw an FVP on the day, on Friday, right? Now you see the liquidity areas of the volume. I see that there's a high volume node here, right? There's one on the top where we spent quite a bit of time and volume. Then there's the POC. We went inside for the day. Now think about this in terms of value and price. Who cares about buying and selling? Think about the value. So if you think about value, does anyone want to take a stab what happened on Friday? Just so you kind of can get in the habit of analyzing. I'll give you two days, make your life easier. Okay, let me make sure that this is not extended. Right. Does anyone want to, I'll help you. If you get stuck, I'll help you here. Two days, who wants to analyze? We attempted to find value higher, then we didn't accept it, and we went back down into a downtrend. Okay. Is that right? That is very good. Anyone want to add more points? Yeah, we uh, we uh, we ended up today with uh, under the the POC and under the a value area. So we uh, we closed the day under POC under value area low, which uh, leads to believe that the next day we're going to be uh, opening. Uh, okay under the poc all right good anyone else any other points there's a few more i'm missing anyone else uh, don't make me pick on people you know we spiked there at the not spike but uh don't Do worry that. about spikes. Just worry about what you're seeing, value and profile. Okay. We're in a downtrend. Okay. Is the POC shifting down? POC and value area highs are clearly shifting down. They had an overlap between Wednesday and Thursday. That's correct. Then 
this is where I pay attention a lot to the volume notes, right? So that's why, I, you know, when I put this stuff in here, they have a meaning to why, right? So if you think about this profile, let's say where we started a sell-off, right? We accumulated here, right? Now I would say we hit this POC and then you had this, uh, call it gap down, right? You had the mm -hmm. gap down and then from here, this level is going to be crucial for any upward action. 47.88. This is the one that caused the majority of the pain for the, 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 I would say, longs. So now if you take a look at it, right, they accumulated here in this zone here, right? They accumulated and this one failed to break that POC of sell-off. Now you want to look at it and see anytime they come to this level, how do we react to it? Well, from this volume, high volume node on the bottom, this is the bottom distribution of this day, right? This is the bottom high volume node. One second. If you need anything, I'm in the bathtub. Thanks, man. Appreciate the info. <laughs> uh, are, you, are you talking about <laughs> Friday? Or some soap? Shorty, are you talking about last Friday? Friday the 29th? Sure. Sure, Dave. Hope you're prepared that you don't have to ask him questions on what you're teaching us. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good when you have a kid like that, man. Very fine. Yeah, really so now if you look at the distributions, right, and it, it, you have to pay attention to the high volume nodes and how we are reacting to them. Mm -hmm. So if you look here, we bounce from here and we, you know, somebody mentioned earlier, we failed to clear higher high. In this case, we failed, then they gap down. And look now, the same high volume node here, we came for the retest the next day, we failed. Then you had this day produced a high volume node, right? I would say somewhere, I'm just gonna highlight it, maybe different color. So you can hear orange and look what happened. On this, I would say double distribution day, uh, you had one, you had two. They closed, where did they close? They closed way below the POC. They came back to this double distribution day. They reclaimed the POC, went higher, and then they went above and then they failed. This is not a bad short. Nine out of 10 times, it's going to pay when you have a double distribution like day like this. They accepted the price, but they accepted it also below this distribution of this day, right? They went lower to that. And then if you think about this, if this was our value area low, what is this, Wednesday? For Wednesday, the value area low, they came back and they're like, oh man, we, we do find some value here. They found the value here. They popped it, but then they lost it. They came back to it. But what happened then? They extended that value. They extended the value lower. Why do we go lower? Let's fix that poor structure. Why, why, Actually, do, we, why do we keep selling? We keep More selling. We, we shut off sellers. We, <laughs> there's no value at the top. Well, there's no, no value. We shut off sellers. You want to shut off the sellers, guys. <laughs> Yeah. The first thing I mentioned here, you have to go back to it. You're selling to shut off the selling. You want to find buyers. So now we had some buyers, and I would say we are familiar with this 27 level just because of the homework we did prior. This was what level here? On Thursday, what was it? PDL. True. It was a previous PDL, week value area low. It was previous week value area low, but it also happened to be that there were single prints involved uh, on TPO. So we are aware of the levels. The key levels were identified. They came back. We established this, right? And then during the RTH session here on Friday, like they cracked the 27, and then we had, I think it was 03 that we had. No, 02. I think we were here. Somewhere. Yeah, 02. Let's just draw a level here. We anticipate a bounce at the O3 level because of the FVP high volume node. But when you go yeah. back day to day, everything checked out, but there was a slowdown in the auction. There was a major slowdown in the auction that I, I think we even brought it up on Thursday. Do you guys remember when I asked you guys that? Well, CK brought it up. Remember, he said that there's a slowing down in the auction. I'm not sure if CK is on. But we said, hey, the value area lows and highs are shifting. But then it started kind of over. Yeah, I remember that. And auctions, if they start slowing down, just like we talked about, you know, when, when you sell peanut butter, right? If you auction so higher, you're not going to have participants at those levels. 
you're going to have to drag that price lower to bring in participation from the other side. You need your position to step in, start buying or selling, depending on where you are. And in this case, this is a clear sign. Whenever you see values overlapping, PO, POC is getting tighter. And before, I don't know if you guys remember, at one point, uh, I actually, oh, this I thought it was, an, I thought it was SVP for a second. <clears throat> so here, you see the overlap is happening and you can measure the POC spread between them, right? You see that there's, you know, there's 37 points in between this one, this one. It's slowing down a little bit. And then you see here, not much, right? So what you can expect, let's say come Monday, what would you guys expect to see here? How would you play this now that you see Market slowing down, the auction shifted down, the value areas are overlapping. We came to a support. You respected the HVNs, right? Some major HVNs that you sold off from, you respected. What about this HVN here? Do you guys think this one might play a role at all come Monday? It'd be a bounce off. Yes. Yeah. I would definitely watch this one. Right to see how they react to it at forty-seven thirty-two. Any other ones you guys would watch? I gotta shift this. My brain can't do this. Uh, I would uh, watch for the where it bounced at the bottom there at at uh, O two. Crap. Okay. What's O two? Yep. Uh, this one. I don't see a volume note there. There's definitely not a volume node at the um, bottom there. At the PD value area low, if I was going to play, I would wait for it for the break of PD value area low, retest, and then and then take a short. Yeah, we're going to gap up tomorrow. Okay. In that case, then I would wait for it to break POC, break above PD value area high, retest, and go high. What type of profile is this? Uh, it's a D shape with an expanded uh we call that uh with an expanded um I forget the word. Okay. D shape a with a flow high, right? I don't know, it looks like a like a That's definitely double, a high. triple distribution oh, yeah. triple distribution. I don't know. I would say there's excess here on the bottom without looking on market profile. Just yeah. because of how skinny yeah. this is on the bottom. I'm sure there's excess here. Also, would you would you look at something for me? Not right now. Not right now. Okay. Let, me, let me finish this. It's on this though. After you finish. Yep. Bean, when we were trading uh, on Friday, we mentioned that it would be really good for them to go to the POC. Do you recall that when we were trading NQ? We said it would be. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I said it'd be really nice if it does that. Yeah. I was already yeah. done trading, but yeah. Mr. Bean and said then that. it ran. Like, yeah. <laughs> and then it yeah. ran. We went below the value on NQ and then we fucking ran. We ran like 70 points, if you recall. And Bean was like, well, maybe, maybe they will do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Little did, did he say that they came back here, right? And you look at the price section, 930. We put in a higher low inside the value area. If you're putting in the higher low inside the value area low, what does that tell you in terms of price and acceptance of that price? I'm not letting it drop to a certain level and I'm already buying. <laughs> you know, go higher. That means there's a little bit of more The wicks we had on the five minute was ridiculous. Well, yeah, on the five minute candles, you had two nice long big, wicks uh, right here. Yep, and we were long somewhere around here. I forgot the level where we were long, but we were long at some point here. Regardless, it, it's telling you if this is our value area low, and typically on 30 minutes, it's going to give you a more accurate level, and it's not coming close to it. And then they start buying to the reversion to the mean. What does that tell you in terms of value and participation of buyers? Measly want it. Right? Starting to go back up. Yeah. They want it now. <laughs> so on, on Monday, when you look at this, and we are on ETH here on volume profile, on market profile, we use RTH. If we're, you know, you're right at the POC, mm -hmm. right? On NQ, you're right at the POC. ES, you're right at the POC. Mm -hmm. We can open 
tomorrow, most likely we're going to have a gap up. If we gap up and they come back to this POC, <laughs> what do you hey. think happens? Oh, yeah. Take it long. Yeah, I, I got a question on this one, Shorty. Sure. So uh, we have single prints back from December 13th, right? Mm -hmm. That made a big, huge, skinny belly on TPO, looking only at RTH. Mm -hmm. And if we take them over to today, right, if we look at yesterday or Friday, we do not have, you know, we, we have just a single uh, square. We do, we do not have a tail. Yet we do have past single prints from the December 13th. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, what I'm yeah. Saying. On the bottom, on the bottom, we don't have we don't have a nice long tail unless you're looking at what we're picking up from December 13th. And I guess what I'm trying to ask is that 13th in TPOs still hold weight? I would say yes. Well, yes, without, that's what I was saying. Zoom out. out. Oh, we're at a huge support level. Where if you zoom out, there we go. That's what I was trying to say. See which ones are you after? Yeah, you just this is uh, ETH. You are, yeah, you got to go RTH on this one. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> shift a little bit. You guys switching to market profile. Let it load. Give it a second. I was just covering volume. That one. We'll switch here. Are you guys talking about this day or this day here? Are you talking about the FMO? It was the, the it was the thirteenth. Yeah, the thirteenth. Whatever. That right. Probably. Let's see here. That's Thanks right forward. here. Your single prints are here, and then obviously all the way to the bottom here. Yeah. Okay. And look but then yesterday's was oh this was actually in the middle when I mean, you're looking at RTH, you had a CP you had a POC below it, so it was actually not a tail. Uh, for me, it's yes. Uh, I'm talking December thirteenth, RTH on N on ES. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on NQ, man. You're, you're sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> Yeah, you're, you're sending me a bunch of curveballs now. Hold on. I don't watch out for Mr. Bean. So let's see now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see if it refreshed. 13 is, this is the 13th right here. Okay. This was the PS Repock. Right, so above it, you see all the green single prints you got up there? Yep. That huge band there. Now you've used some of those up. So if I if you highlight that zone or whatever, yep, you then we go over to the right. And we go over to the right. We still got a whole bunch of that left below, but you only have a single I'm only showing like a single uh well, what where do you have it now? I'm sorry. Where we have a bunch of it unused. Where is it? I would say it goes all the way down as low as seven forty seven oh eight. 75? I'm not following. We cleaned up all of this in ETH. Okay, yeah. that was my question. Because I thought we looked for only for RTH. So no, ETH, we, we do take the, the, Yeah, so look at this now. Just go back. No, 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 I understand. Yeah. We trade, if, I look at, if I look at what we did after hours, but I wasn't sure with TPO if we're just supposed to be looking at, at I, RTH. I typically look at the cash session, but it's a little bit subjective, right? Okay. When you have, you know, when you have the Globex, right? I don't use, for TPO, I don't use Globex because the liquidity uh, is just not there. But okay. when you look at this candle here that came in, you, right? you categorize that as being cleaned up. That that's what I, was yeah. that was the thing. I wasn't sure if that would be categorized or not. Here's your volume bar for this session right here at eight thirty, and I mm -hmm. look at the volume for the remainder of that Globex. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. ten times more volume. Yeah, yeah we had a lot Easily of volume. 10 times. 
And then I look at, you know, I just have to look at, you know, just subjectively. You look at this candle here, and the rule that I mentioned to you guys is the wick to the body, and you play that. And what happened here? Stopping volume. Stopping wow. volume. This fella did not. <laughs> he was not interested, guys, in, in price going below his bind. At all. <laughs> The price came here, and I, I have to struggle with this little thing here on the right. And now you see here, wait to the body, and look where it came. He's like, oh, no. We don't want that. And then they bounce right higher. So, yes, if, if that answers your question, it's subjective. If this volume here, let's say this volume was like this volume here, yeah, I wouldn't care for it. But, you know, these people are experts. They came in. At 8.30, when you guys can't trade the options, yeah. and they did it perfectly at 4,700, and then they ran it, you know, 50 points, 60 points, right? Right, and then they closed wherever they closed. So now, if we look at this from the standpoint of ETH, we've got a nice little tail on this day, but if I go RTH, we don't. That's correct. I would still consider the ETH positioning on it, just because we saw them come. <laughs> Drive yeah, because of the volume that came through. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, cool. Thank you. It came in closer to the open than it did. Like if it was a midnight guy, it seems like somebody from Burnside World is buying or selling. Yeah, Burnside. Yeah. Always my fault. Yeah. yeah. yeah Burnside is all your fault. <laughs> this was definitely you, somebody you, from Europe. I would have got away with it if it weren't for metal. Yeah, man. Not even Cubans. <laughs> make i don't want my choice look like dumpsties with fucking colorful parrots okay so now that we shifted to market profile let me go back a little bit to volume profile uh hopefully that answered a question for two of you at least uh, svp on svp i definitely look at you know for that reason i look at sv now i guess you answer this why do I look at ETH on volume profile? Because of people like him. Does that make sense? Just because it, it's not RTH, but he, he handed out quite a bit of volume here and he created a node. Yeah. yeah. He created a value node right here and that's exactly where <laughs> 330, they came back and bounced it and spiked it back inside to POC. So this guy is pretty present there. So if you're able to crack below this guy, let's say tomorrow, if you're able to absorb him, could I short this 18 to 7 to this level? Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. This would be a pretty good short. Of course. That means we absorb this guy that was buying right before open on US. But if we're, let's say, on ES tomorrow, let's say we open above this POC, the chances of us hitting this level right here, 46, are fairly high. So if you crack above 37, let's say, and you come back for a retest, you can catch 10 points fairly easy. Why would this level be important to me? Like exactly, let me make sure I, why this level here? I'm giving you a clue. Think about- POC is at the value area high? What the, was the overlapping. Why, what was once? Value area low became the next day's fair price. So was that day's fair price became the extreme value area high. Oh, high. <laughs> right, right, right. Does that make you sense? That, you, yeah, yeah, that would be a break of structure. I mean, a change of character. character. Yeah, so if you're able to, let's say you crack this level here of 46, you know, the next level most likely you're headed to just look at the, you know, look at what the chart's telling you. You have the POC at 54, which I would be aware of, right? And then you look at the value area high. So you had the value area, it wasn't really respected here. It was at 57. Then you have somewhere around, can't see these damn levels too well, uh, 64. That would be the targets that you're playing. So now if I'm looking just trading volume profile, I, Personally, to me, this gives me a clear picture. If it doesn't, that's this is where you guys ask questions. So we we cannot afford to lose. I would say my initial long would be I wouldn't wait for this level to hit again. Why not? 
why would I expect buyers to show up at this zone first? Because pre-market, you had such a volume coming in, it looks like they're changing direction. Okay, good. Anyone Based else? on that spike. And also, it's a high volume nod, right? The high low. Okay. Good. What about, like, I know you guys like trend lines. What about high or low? If I was to bounce here, that would be what? I would break oh, this trend line. Trend I would create lines. fear yeah. on people, right? Then people will start shorting. Can they do still break this trend line and do this bounce? Yep. This would be a yep. really good trap. They would trap the people here, but this node here, I promise to you, is going to play a big role tomorrow, right here. Yeah. In the middle, yeah. Four and a half. Yeah. They're going to yeah. most likely, if they auction pre market 24 and a half, let's say today, tonight at six. I would expect them to come back here and I guess I will be I will be there. They might overlap a little bit and then go higher. Yeah, they're gonna hit this level here. If they're to come back to test this level again mm -hmm. and they come in with force, I would not trust this level as much as I would trust this one to buy. Of course. Yeah. I want the eager buyer, just like they were here, to buy sooner. I don't want them to wait for this guy here because this guy showed up mm -hmm. once already. Yeah, if they go down there, they they might go lower. They're going to crack it. They're going to search for value lower. And that's okay if yep. they search, but I, I would prefer them to hold this. Sure. Right now, they're just creating liquidity for the move. And for me, the auction is slowing down. Just like when, you know, when we were looking at this move, I issued a warning in the room that the auction was slowing down here. And I also mentioned that the same exact move happened last time when we were at all time highs because of the December value. Okay. On the, on the so, daily, we had also yeah, hit the yeah. clouds and the bottom of the cloud that we had broken through the top all the way to the bottom of the cloud of the week daily. And uh, we had gotten a full send up on the 30 minute, I think. Shorty, can you, can you switch to NQ? I think it looks pretty much the same, but to make there sure it, yeah. it does, right? Uh, what did I do here? There it, is. it has the same concept, right? Yeah. So you're yeah. coming back. You have two V pucks here, value area low. This level here is really, really important. Four and four twenty six. I mean, and you look at okay, just don't be blind, right? If you're looking here, remember what I said about low volume nodes and skinny belly protection? We mm -hmm. are protecting the crap out of this because if they can't let's say we put in a lower low here lose 32 you know you have another i would say 300 points i would definitely not short anywhere near here oh yeah if you lose the pdl yeah yeah if you lose this pdl guys there's a quick drop and they could have some massive news come out here within the next few days uh, their job is to get you out of the positions and get you to, you know, feel something. You can go from there to December rally area low and, and, and nothing. And now you look, and if you do the same thing we did on ES, if you're a NQ trader, let me, let me go on eight hours just to get a little bit less candles. From 33 to 83. If you go here, and I just go to this high here, look. For this run up here that we had, the, the POC sitting somewhere around, what is this, 74? Let me gotta change these colors a little bit. So you have this here, and then the volume node really starts somewhere around here. What is this? Uh, can't tell, 118. So you're gonna slow down a little bit up here. And I wouldn't be shocked, let's say in, by Tuesday, that we have this drop and then the rest of the week we have a really good recovery right so that was just you know looking on basically on the fvp and then we use previous levels right like what we did talked about in the powerpoint right we have different methods to look at the volume profile so we look at the weekly the dailies i showed you guys on the daily now i showed you fvp Right now, what you're seeing here, this is our this is our weekly profile. So each profile has a week worth of data. Now, when you look at this on NQ, uh, there should be things that you notice slowly as you use it more immediately. 
right? If I look at this right now, the value area low of this level here is sitting, where is it? Uh, 16, let's call it 16.6. 600. Yeah, 16.6 is the, you know, the value area low of this level, which is close by to this value area high. Not something you want to trade in between here. Like between here, it's going to be a lot of chop. And if you look at these candles here, you don't see candles, you just see wicks here. So it's going to be a dangerous zone to trade and initiate a lot of positions. You will need them to break this for you. So this area here, whoever wins this right now, if bulls reclaim this area above here, all good for them. Most likely where they're headed is going to be somewhere at the top uh, to retest this. All right, they have some volume nodes, but ultimately they're going to drive and they short squeeze right out of this. If they are not able to support this, let's say from this low, uh, let's say to this high, it's going to be, where did it go? can't see these uh, candles anymore. Okay, and you see this level now here, right? So this was the buying point for them. If they're able to reclaim this here, the momentum will shift for, for the bulls on the longer run. They can then expect to hit this level of 17. That's about 400 points away. So all they have to do is reclaim this little green zone that they have, and they have a run again, because the poor structure is here, right? They are liquidated, liquidated. There's not a lot of structure, right? So they can fix this. They can go back to it, and they can create value for themselves here. So they had the balance, imbalance, and now it would be creating the value much higher. So they have to reclaim, and they held this weekly value area low here, 431, pretty nicely. If they can go back to, what is this, 561, an auction higher on the prior weekly POC, that would be good for them. Breaking this level, and especially this value area high, and reclaiming this value area low, sends, it would be a massive short cover rally to here. This could be a two-day thing here. Okay. So right now, when you look at it, we are in balance on the weekly, right? We're right inside the value area low. If we lose this value area low to the downside, where's the next value that we are going to be searching? 16,100. The balance area there on the left. Yeah, down there. <laughs> this is the last one that we had, right? So most likely they're going to come back and see, uh, are we accepting these prices higher? Guys, remember the screenshot or the PowerPoint slide. We're anticipating them to visit this, right? If they come to this level, it's going to be pivotal for them to defend this. <laughs> if they fail to hold this and they do something like this, then we know the POC is somewhere around here. They get a bounce, and ultimately they will test the value area low of this. So then I would take this previous balance that they had, and they have it at uh, 15,884. And they will potentially just do it like this, and eventually they will test the value area low of this at 15.8 and the bottom here. But this would be the zone that they're targeting. So the weekly so far, when you look at just the weekly candles, along with the profiles, weekly is making lower highs and definitely lower lows, correct? Compared to the candle prior. So we are framing down on the weeklies. On the dailies, I would say you're still framing down on the weeklies, and the framing would stop where? Well, if there, I would probably, you know, you can count this right here or the one above. I'll most likely count this one, 88. If they're able to crack this, right, then the weekly, the daily framing down stops. So far, the weekly and daily are framing down. So the pressure is now on the buyers are they going to show up here and stop it or are we going to break this lower low let's say we break this most likely you're going to come back to the poc of this zone here does that make sense yeah yes. everything is more bearish at the moment and it's in bulls hands what what are they going to do and i would say you know crack this it's going to be a quick drop they have a high potential to drop this really, really quickly to the top of this range here. Okay, so weekly is imbalanced by framing down. Uh, and then you can also check the monthly, even though we're still uh, early in January. Shorty, your uh, previous week value area low, it, it, you have it at 430, um, 
433. Yeah, close enough. Got it. And then you see here for the month, right? If you guys look at the monthlies, let me go on four hours. This is your value area low on thank you, man. My mouse keeps uh, stopping here. If you guys look at it, this is your December value area uh, low here. We are still in balance on, well, I would say, on the monthlies, right? And if you look at the prior month, which is November, look at the value area low here. Is this the area that you're willing to short? I, I, me personally, not really. This is where they can do a lot of damage to people. And that's why yeah, I remember you saying that before. This is where they set the traps. And I would want to be aware where this uh, November value area high is, right? Because if they shift and pretend that we want to search the value area lower, it would mean the acceptance on November value area. Because if this is my acceptance here and they bounce from here, that would be a good spot. And then they can continue trading and building value higher. Mm -hmm. They can go in between here and build value. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, I know you asked the other day in the chat. I read it. I was going to cover it today. Why I mark November value area high, that's one of the reasons, right? I want to be especially aware if we pop like we did here. When you come back, are you defending this price to go higher? And this can be used as a perfect trap here. Yeah. Uh, a few weeks prior, uh, I would say before the year end, uh, uh, we had a watch list. Uh, I don't know what day it was, but I, I warned you guys that this is this can set up for a lot of selling, right? We had November, and then you see the December. We are not able to peak above on NQ on ES. It looks worse. Uh, you'll see on ES. Uh, on ES, I gave you the warning because we went above the value here, and look, we cracked inside. Now. <laughs> uh, Who's lagging, NQ or ES? Yes. ES has more yes. to drop, right? ES can go to yeah, here, which would be 45.68. And if you go on NQ, so ES has, let's measure it, right? It has another 132 points, another 3% to go. On NQ, NQ can drop to this level here. And it could offer a bounce. If NQ decides to break this November value area high, look where it would match. A 3% drop of NQ, this 2.74 here, would be another 3% on each would be pretty good. Would be good for the bulls, and they could cause some major pain for late bears to come in. Okay. So this is just analyzing on, on the longer time frames on volume profile. And this would be a really big level here. Your November POC matching with, <clears throat> with December VPOC here becomes a really good target, right? And now, you know, we drew the FVP earlier here. And you see that that level is it's going to be very important. Because once they lose this, then you're targeting somewhere at 4,200 uh, to be the retest. This was our, if you guys remember, the May consolidation we had. Is everybody following so far? Shorty, you have uh, March puts, right, on the spies? Mm hmm Is your target that 4560 area? Right here. Okay. Because if they do that, you think about this. Let's just do the same thing. I would, if they're to execute this, let's say in January, you're telling me you would get a decent drop from my puts in the direction that we have three months on. A 3% move to the POC of 454 would be $4 out of the money. So that would be pretty good for the puts. Yep. That's the idea behind it. I, I would. I would definitely close it all here. Does that make sense? Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's volume profiles, the three pieces uh, that we had, right? Uh, so let's see. We covered this. 
uh, this one we covered. So standard deviations and sigmas, right? You probably have seen me post this, uh, whether on Twitter or even in the chat, right? And the knowledge seekers use them religiously, right? And I would say a lot of you guys use it here. So when you think about it, you can apply this anytime you have more than two days of consolidation, you can apply the sigmas. It works really well on the longer periods, right? So if you guys think about this uh, on the longer picture here, this is where, you know, your range is right now. So if you think about this chart right here, the blue lines is your range. You see the bottom, you broke in, you came back and tested this, which happens to be, I would say, roughly 50%. This run up here, yeah, right at 50%. They bounced right here, so now we created a range. And then the idea is if you're not making higher highs, that you're going to consolidate and build value here for the next move, whatever that is. So, if this is the range here, this is where you enter this. So I can grab the FVP from here and here, right? And now I'm able to know. Where's my first standard deviation? The first standard deviation is nothing more than just the first value area at 68%. So this would be my first SIG uh, right here. This would be my second SIG. I'm sorry, first SIG on the bottom skew. Uh, so now I have the first SIGs identified. If I want to change this, I can double click on this and change what value area? Where would this one be? 95. 95. You know, the second sigma would be 68 plus 13.6 plus 13.6, which is 27.2. You would add it and you would get 95. So if I change this to 95, the value area is going to shift now. And I'll make it easier for you guys. Let's see. Does it draw lines? No. Oh, it's these lines. So now you're able to see what? This is our second first, this is our second standard deviation. Second sig, yeah. And why why do we draw it? Why why does it matter where the second sig is? First sig. It's the value areas for um sixty eight percent, ninety five and ninety nine. And what else? Anyway. The extremes. Those are the extremes. And who shows up at extremes? Long term. We more yeah. Long term. If, if our area for trading for this is value trading, correct? The green box. I'm sorry, the gray box. This is value trading, correct? Because it's fair value. It's 68%. We trade okay. inside the fair value. Right. This is two standard deviations outside. So a little bit up, a little bit up. That would be the green zone. And then extreme is right here. So if we are trading inside, the big boys are, remember, where do you want to sell if you're a seller? You want to sell inside the value or above the value? Above. Above. So you want to sell above the value and look where the above the value is showing you here for since 2020, November. It's showing you the extreme above the value is right here and right here. To shift these values uh, is on three years, it takes a lot of volume. Does that make sense? Because you're adding a little bit of data to a three year pond of data to shift it. You know, it's pretty heavy. Yeah. So this here is pretty, I would say, pretty important levels in terms of bigger levels and your bias on highest levels. So now this would be our cumulative POC or CPOC or a mean or whatever you want to call it. So now if you're to fall back below this level on three years worth of data, I can't read this, uh, 458.91. If you're to lose that level, there's levels you could identify to know what are the potential levels for a bounce. Can I expect us to visit 412? Yes. Of course. Would I be naive to believe that there's not going to be a single bounce in between that? Yeah. Right. I can look at the rest of the body of this, right? And I can know that there's going to be a bounce at 436. 
right? If we lose 458, most likely it goes to 436. You lose this, uh, high probability that this would happen here. If you lose this, this happens really you high probability. That, you're going to you the, see yeah. skinny belly yeah. below, right? You lose this, we know for a fact you're hitting 392 because that's the yep. lower first sig. Once you establish, let's say sellers come in, initiative sellers step in here, and they lose this level. Yep. Go to the showed up floor. on these levels here was the responsible sellers. Yeah, Shorty, yeah. I've been expecting um us to stay in this giant balance until election. I think we visit um bottom of balance before election. I I think so too. I mean, because yeah, I, I don't I don't try to. <laughs> bring in politics, but you know, right, people but, have to look good. It's just an important, you know, election. Honestly, Correct. This, and I'll they're going to do game. what they have to do to make sure whatever is the agenda, right? And I'm not, I don't care which way they go, right? Uh, as long as I can day to day understand what's happening, I can make money, I don't care. Mm -hmm. But the idea is, right, you have the election year and, you know, Taiwan has an election year and also they have ships right now in tai Taiwan area. Remember, I said Q1, something big has to happen in that area because uh, of the elections. Yeah. And them long so a lot comes into play, right? Them long uh, swings can pay. Exactly. Yeah. So if you look here, every time we approach two, three sigma, that's where you're going to have these long-term buyers and sellers because the price is advantageous to them. Whether it's fairly above the value, the 68% it is, but it's in the two, three sigma, this is where they're mostly taking their profits and closing their longs. At the bottom, they're buying it because there's a high potential for reversion to the mean. Okay. If they're able to break those means, let's say two, three with volume, that would mean that the revert, I'm sorry, the initiation of these guys is fairly strong and that they're going to expect to proceed in the direction that they're going. So I'm looking for a slide. It's this one here. When it's way above the value here, you're expecting responsible activity or they're expecting them to start selling while they feed to the retail. Hey, how many banks in the past three months upgraded the stock market, Apple, Tesla to some crazy levels? Just recently, Apple got upgraded numerous times by one bank and that same bank just downgraded them two months after. We haven't had an earnings release in between the periods when they upgraded and downgraded them. What are you downgrading them based off? <laughs> right? So you, you have to think about logically, right? Are they really buying Apple? Let's say this was Apple's chart, which would probably be the same. Uh, like this one. Are they really buying Apple right here? <laughs> Hell no. You have to be naive to think that there's value for these people to buy it here. Right now, they're giving them all you can eat, right? Because, oh, we're at the retest level of the previous range high, right? And two times, you're not able to to hold it. All the pattern traders that are sitting in the world is like, oh, my God, double top with the neckline here. So what they can expect is they can do this. They hit the neckline. You'll find the POC, and they're, they're just going to bounce it, right? This was the node. Node, most likely, it's going to be headed to 150 here. And I would expect a decent balance there. Right? And the cycle just repeats. Does everybody understand the two, three, six right now? I didn't mean to steer you guys away from it, but does everybody follow what it does and how to and you play use it? this when you have consolidation, right? You use it when you have two plus days of consolidation. You can definitely use it on the longer periods like we did here for three years. These are not your, you know, day-to-day -day levels. If you see the two, three, six, you're entering swings. Uh, that's why I'm in a swing entry here. Let's say if we don't bounce at 458, that would be the best scenario for those in spy puts for March. Let's say they give us a treat uh, and they crack 458. I have no reason to close until we arrive to this level. But this level here would be super important for them because here they created a node. They're below it. If they don't crack this node now at, what, what is this, 470 soon, then most likely we're headed here. And if they push up again and I see, you know, weakness on buying, well, then I would probably consider maybe May, June puts, and I would consider 430. Buy more time, you know, extend my target. 
even the seed pot for this year is not too far. Okay. So does everybody understand how to draw the FVP? And if you don't, if you go here, this is a video, you just have to go in the presentation mode uh, here. And if you click, it's going to start playing this video for you guys. And you guys can do the same thing. And I believe I annotate everything that you need to do to draw it on this video itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I keep clicking this damn video now. Okay. So this is a visual and example that combines your standard deviations. And I'll, my, my secret, and not really a secret, when I buy shares of companies, when I search for, um, let's see, let's say Pfizer, right? If you look at Pfizer, right, a lot of people would say, man, why are you buying it here, right? But when you look at the data, right, where are we right now? Uh, let's see, here's our 68, right? Sorry, the colors change based on the template. It's going to enable this so you guys can actually see this. Okay, so this is our 68 of this period that we consolidated here at 26. Now you can kind of apply the logic and who cares what, when you find a good company at these levels like Pfizer and uh, you look at the history, right? A little bit, this is a, key levels for them right here, 2696. Then I change this to 95 uh, and it's sitting right here. I promised you that this level right here did not impact this sell off that much here and these levels. You can go back and test it yourself. And then the three sig is right here. Okay. So you're telling me that I should wait until I see a green candle here higher high on the green candle right here 27 something and then this thing went to 30 dollars and i had the opportunity to buy 25. <laughs> on a good company like this i typically i buy at the bottom of this and that's exactly what what i did on on pfizer if this is to come back again to about 27 or this poc i can add more it would increase my average but i can add more but i have a i would say a decent size i need for pfizer and you can do this on every stock, for instance, that you're buying. Like, you know, he bought, brought in Pfizer. I would not necessarily buy Pfizer here because uh, I would say we got, oh, I'm sorry, not Pfizer, Verizon, much lower than here. I don't know if anyone had it on their list, but we've been watching this one. I don't even know for how long now. I would say for a very long period of time, we've been buying this right here. Yeah, they came in. Entered, mm -hmm. It just entered a giant skinny belly. Oh yeah, I'm no, targeting uh, fifty. Yeah, so let's see, gray six, uh, gray. I I posted it earlier. Yeah, that's why I'm. Uh, that's why I brought it up. It's it's at a it's at a good level here, but we I think I have a a really good fill for it. So now if you look at this, this it just entered. It probably reached some extremes here before that. So if you go ninety five. Here's 95, so second standard deviation. But if you zoom in a little bit, look at the volume nodes that they have here. Huge skinny belly cracked. They didn't really come here. Eagerness and you know the bottom of it they hit. So now can you expect them to run this all the way to what is this like 42? Yep. Above that, I mean they can target this POC here at 50. And if you guys got it uh, when I got it, uh, it would be somewhere between 30 and 32 that you got this uh, stock in your portfolio. But they also pay dividends. It's a really, really good company. But that's how you can look at it, right? From a longer perspective, you can use these SIGs, right? To identify where the other people are going to hop in. So you can hop in with them as well. And another one I'm watching is this one here, right? Like just to kind of give you an idea, right? I'm using, you know, I can use the same concept. They consolidated here, right? They came back for a retest, so I can do either, oh, sorry. I can use this, or I can start from here and see what's happening, right? What, where are they buying or selling right now? So let's see. 
So they sold off there below the POC. So do I have any interest maybe to buy this volume node where they're sitting right here? You could. I have no interest. Probably was better, obviously, to buy at the bottom of this volume node. But ideally, look where they bounce right here, 82, perfectly. So if I can get it somewhere cheaper, I would definitely, you know, get some of this uh, Nike. And that one probably going to be where? Right here at 67. So if they offer anything in that range, I'd be heavily interested. Companies like that one, Starbucks. So Starbucks is just starting its fall right now. So I'm probably not going to look at it for a longer period of time before I can fire some shares. Same concept, right? They have, I would say, a little bit more to go. Uh, yeah, I would not. I don't know, yeah. I'll let other people buy this right here. Somewhere around 75, I'll be a buyer in Starbucks. Like, I don't know if you guys remember. You guys recall how long we waited for this? <laughs> I think Dom Steve remembers it. He was uh, eager to buy this. So this was a good one. Uh, uh, you can do the same thing on Coke. I actually got Coke at a really good price. Probably should be getting ready to sell it here. Was that when you were in Colombia? This one? <laughs> Not that type of Coke. But this is probably a good level to take some profits on this. I got it somewhere here. Uh, this is it's also a dividend company. But I use these six to confirm everything I'm buying, to see where they're buying also. All right, so that covers that. Value your area tips and tricks. If you're going to learn anything about volume profile and market profile, this is applicable to both, is to understand where are we in compared to the value, whether it's, you know, it depends if you're a long-term swinger trader or if you're trading futures or if you play options on SPY. You want to understand where are you compared to other of the same time frame. Uh, what I mean by that, if you're opening uh, on Let's see here on the daily profile of Coca-Cola. This is our daily profile. We're just going to go extended hours. Let's go on ES because it doesn't have these weird lines. Okay. So now if you think about this, right? Uh, if this was our value area uh, high here, I'm sorry, low. And if we opened below here, right? What does that tell you? If you're opening below the value area, what does that tell you? Bullish bears. or bearish? Bears. Bears. It's definitely bearish, right? Even you think about it just logically, where was once value here, uh, we are no longer opening at that value. We're opening below your value because we can't find buyers. That's logically bearish. If you open below the POC, your bear sentiment, you know, spikes a little bit. When you open below the PD value area low, it, it's quite a bit. If you gap down below the range low, right? Range low would be your PDL, for instance, right here. Of this day, I'm comparing this day to this day. So 27 was range low, and you see here at 9:30. Let's go RTH for a second. Okay, so if you opened, let's see, Friday is right here, and you opened, <laughs> where? Where did you open on Friday? Pretty much, right, in, in the area of your PDL, and you did not allow it, right, to go back, but you open below the value area low, and then when you reclaim the value area low, right, do you guys remember this from the notes when we talked about? We had the 27 level, do you guys, uh, 27 level we had here. Do you guys recall any of this? I think I wrote it in your shorty's corner. Does anyone remember? No? Okay. So if you guys go here, that's actually a little bit higher on 30 minutes. This was our level. We, we needed to open about the 40. Then we had, if you guys remember this, I think it was 46 level. That being asked, how do you get the 46? Uh, we had the 46 level sitting right here. And then above that, we had 54. If you guys recall, that was somewhere here. This POC. 
So for us, it was no interest of, hey, if we are able to reclaim 40, there's a high chance that you're going to hit and complete uh, the PD value area high 80% rule, which would be targeting what was it, 60 something, 57. So 57. So reclaiming of PD value area low is bullish. If you open below it and you reclaim this PD value area low, that's a really, really bullish setup. Can anyone conceptualize and explain why? You rejected prices below and then you accepted higher into that value area. Exactly. So if you're rejecting, any time you fall out of outside of value area, that means you're rejecting the value inside. If you fell inside and then you reclaim it, that tells you that you're also rejecting the price is lower. If you're rejecting prices lower, what do you think you're going to test next? Well, you're going to test the extreme to see if the behavior changed on the top. And Usually it, with more force, right? Well, well, you they gave you all the force you could to get it back yeah. up uh, yeah. from 47. They went back and they tested yeah. the extreme and yeah. they said, hey, we, we, yeah, we don't find any value here. What well, they home. had to hold at that point, they had to hold this. Right. Why did they have to hold this from the prior day value area low? Because I'm drawing this with zones, right? This is the zone where we wanted to create acceptance, meaning right here. This is where the bulls had to create the acceptance. Did they? No, we closed right below it. So let's say tomorrow, right, we open above this POC and they come inside right here. Well, they could again test this here because that would mean mm -hmm. that now they're shifting the value value area low is most likely going to shift here. If the value area high stays here, they could create a three-day balance. It'd be more, right? Be we could take a good long, long right there, right off of that retest. This would be a good retest to go long because yeah. now they're rejecting prices lower, right? They're seeking prices higher, but they, they could not close inside of this. If we open above, gap up, and stay here, they're going to explore this multiple mm -hmm. times. Here it's yeah. going to stay. Once they crack this area, most likely they're going to be targeting the top here. I know I drew a bunch of crap here. Once they, yeah. let's say, crack this area, immediately you can target that you're going to hit this, you know, this POC, I think it's 54 and then 57. And then you zoom out a little bit and you see here, right, if we start building value above this, you're going to be in some kind of four day balance uh, being created here. Yeah. Okay. So when you look at the PowerPoint here that I was pointing to, the stock opens above the value area and then it falls back inside the value area, this is a strong bear signal. You should be able to visualize pretty much every single one of these bullets. If the stock price opens below the value area and then it rallies back inside the value area, that's exactly the one that, that we just talked about. That's exactly what they did here, right? They fell back inside, right? If you think about it, they fell back inside and then they reclaimed it and they explored a higher. That's exactly what they did. If the stock price opens above, below the value and continues to stay above, below, that's basically institutional buying and selling. You, you want to, you want the, the price is going to continue in the trend that we are in now. Right now, no. they're telling you the trend slowing down multiple ways. Yeah. <clears throat> Indication of a trend if a series of values is moving in a clear direction through time, then new price levels are being accepted and trend is finding acceptance. That's true, right? If the values begin to overlap and move in the opposite direction of the trend, the chances are good the trend is slowing down and beginning to balance. Well, would you not say that that's where we are right now? Yeah. We had higher high, lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low. Uh oh, now we have a lower high, lower low, but they're overlapping. Now you have, again, lower high and lower low, but they're getting really, really tight. So if you're able to auction, let's say, higher here, of, what is this, 46, you would most likely get a short squeeze. We could go either way, right, Shorty? Yeah, of course. I mean, you can go either way, but the trend, what the, right, right, right. Is, the trend is slowing down. Yeah. Okay. This is important to know. The price is either accepted or rejected. There's no, I don't know, oversold, overbought. None of that shit it matters. Right. Mm -hmm. Price is going to be accepted or not accepted, just like you. If you're to, you know, buy something, you know, let's say you want to buy a house, and the house that you want to buy, the guy is asking a million. 
if the house is true market value and the market values things. Like if you're in a house that's $500,000 and you put it up for, I had a neighbor, he was the laughing stock of the street. So he put up a house for a sale. He built it for about $700,000, really nice house. He put it up for sale three months later for 1.7. And we stopped by and we're like, are you okay? Like, is everything <laughs> clicking in your head? He's like, yeah, there's a crazy market. People are going to buy. Is he wrong for trying to sell at that no. level? No. no. Hell no. He can ask whatever you want. But how much participants, or how many bids did he get at 1.7? <laughs> Not many. Zero. None. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> and then was he upset? No, I talked to him. Like, right? He came out cutting grass. I was like, oh, it didn't go well because like, nobody bit. <laughs> he knew what he was doing. Yeah, of course. Right. If he built it for seven, sell it, he was trying to make a million dollars in four He's months. He's trying to make as much as he can. Why not? But that's, you know, the, the price moved away from the value. He shifted the price way far from the value. And of course, he's a responsible seller. He's trying to sell and make money. But if the market was to dip, and let's say he's upside down on his mortgage, I'll be the first neighbor to go to him and offer him 350 cash for it. I would try to help him. Here's 350. You go on and buy a house somewhere in the boonies. I'll take this house. I can sit on it for a long time, right? That would be me buying below the value and below the price that he actually built it for. I would be getting a 50% discount on it, right? And that's the same concept here. Long-term buyers are mostly active at the extremes. And if the price, if somebody accepted that price at 1.8, you know who would be the happiest person in the, besides the guy selling? Who would be the happiest person? You. It would be me and the neighbors around him. Yeah. Do you, do you, have you guys ever heard of the joke of a gypsy and a doctor selling the house? <laughs> no. So a gypsy lived next to a doctor, right? <laughs> and the uh, they had identical house, if you can, I mean, just like any neighborhood now, copy paste. Yeah. So the doctor lists his house for sale and he puts half a million dollars. And the gypsy looks at it, she's like, man, this guy's crazy. He's like, I'm gonna sell it for a million. Yeah. And the gypsy lists his house for a million. And the doctor goes, man, it's like, why are you fucking crazy? Why are you listing your house for a million? While we have the same house, mine's $500,000. Yeah. Well, the gypsy goes, well, when you sell your house, you say you live next to a gypsy. When I sell my house, I say I live next to a doctor. <laughs> right. So that perception is different, right? And you yeah. do the same thing. But the stock, market, the stock market is that when you guys are, when you look at the market, is it in balance, is it in a, in a short term slowdown? Right now, we're in a slowdown. You want to be careful shorting. Because right now it's going to need somewhere to find more fuel for it. Mm. And the importance for the next couple of days of where we open. And if you see, we'll get to it shortly on the single prints on the market profile. Are you seeing single prints or not? It's going to be really, really important. And we already have seen some single prints. Other time frame traders are any traders that are not daytime, daytime, daytime traders. Make sure you remember that. That was also on your quiz. I'm going to release the quiz again here for newer people to take it. Uh, when the price moves away, remember this applies again to volume profile and market profile. When the price, this has been sitting here for I don't know how many, a year. When the price moves away from value in the last period, the 30 minutes, that's called a spike. Those are important and that happened on Friday. As we were trading live, we said, what if they go back to POC? And mm. what if it became, oh shit, they just did it. We went below, they cracked inside, they never allowed to crack below again. So there was no sellers involved anymore. And then they rallied back up, right? So you want to pay attention to the last 30 minutes and see how, what's the behavior, right? It, if you print anything out from the PowerPoint and you want to learn value, I would print the next couple of slides from the value areas perspective. Right. Uh, the way market opens up to relationship to the previous day, if you're a day trader, is is your bread and butter. It really is. You want to understand where we are opening in relationship to the, the previous day so you can establish your bias for the day. You can accept if the price is being 
accepted or rejected, right? And that will give you 50% higher chance to have a better trade than without knowing this. So there's four concepts, right? That you should know, but you know, remember it. It should be able to recognize it on a chart within 30 seconds. Are we opening outside the PDA but inside the range? Is anyone confused what this means? Right here. Anyone confused what this means? Could you visualize? Is there anyone that cannot visualize this? Guys, as a trader, you're a storyteller. You, you, you have to be able to tell the story of where the market, the best storytellers pretty much own the world. And that's not only in trading, that's also in, in, in your, the rest of your life. Can, can you visualize this and tell the story of this? Is there anyone that can't? So the range would be the high of that value area, right? The high of the day and the low of the day is the range. The value area is the 68% of the volume in that day. Got it. Okay. So good question. I was waiting for somebody new to ask. Glad you did. This is what it looks like. If our PD value area high is here, right? And this is PD value area low. This is opening with the PD value area, right? There's no range involved in this. If you're opening inside the range and you stay inside this PD value area high, that means you're accepting the value. You're accepting that value to trade inside. You're happy. When people are happy trading at a value, that means they are accepting the price. If you go back and you're constantly buying the bread at the bakery or whatever, right, at $3 and price stays at $3, are you going to keep buying it at $3? Do you have a reason not to buy it? That they haven't increased it, right? And you need it day to day. So yeah, like you want to continue to buy it. Sure. If the, if the gas price right now goes to fifteen dollars a gallon, how many of you will email your boss and say, "Hey, man, uh, or woman, I cannot come to office uh, five times a week." Any of you? <laughs> yeah. Or I would. Oh, you would question it because it would increase the expenses of your life, right? You have some kind of formula, how much you bring, how much you expend. And if it goes to $15 a gallon, you travel 40 miles an hour, you have some computations to do. Yeah. Like, oh, shit, I can't come five times a day unless you give me a $100,000 raise. Yeah. Right? And that's where, at that point, price would be rejected because most likely you would not be participating in buying there. So... This is acceptance example, right? You're opening inside and you're staying inside. You had a quick drop. They can do this, right? They, they're, they have freedom to drop this below the value, but they quickly reclaimed it and they stayed the whole day inside the value. That's opening within and accepting. That's the first example. And this is it. I added IBH and IBL just to kind of slowly introduce it to you guys. Then you have a rejection, right? This is our PD value area high and low here. Right, but we are rejecting. Rejecting doesn't mean you're going lower. Rejecting means you don't accept that value as the value, whether it's value area high or low, is irrelevant. In this case, you can be a bullish rejection or a bullish accept uh, rejection. In this case, you know this is our PD value area high, and we rejected it and we went lower. That means that this value that was being presented from prior day is no longer being accepted. On this case, we have a bullish rejection. We're going higher. Okay, everyone following so far. We only covered two. We covered acceptance, where you stay inside the value area. And now when you're opening within the value area, but you're rejecting. If you're to think about confidence of the market, which one would you rank higher? Is market confident when it accepts inside the value and it never drops in, inside or outside, I'm sorry, or this one here when you reject it? Which one sends a firmer decision? When you stay inside? Yeah. Acceptance. Okay. If I open, I immediately get out of the, the value area from the prior day and never look back. Is that confident? Yeah, that's um, very confident. Yeah, that's very confident. It, and, and it depends in terms of context, right? If you see that we're inside the value area and we break it, Let's say we break this one here. Uh, let's say you break this one here and you come back. The confidence level on that play for the bulls is none. Right. 
right? If you pop above and you fail immediately, that's really bearish. Yeah, you're rejecting right? the that. The same thing would be on the bottom side, right? Let's say you pop outside and you reclaim it. The odds of you exploring the rest of the area of the value area are extremely high. Yeah, that's not confident. You have a lot of you know buyers that are eager to explore prices higher. So I always think about it. How is it in terms of confidence? Is the price being accepted? Is it not being accepted? The confidence becomes really, really important. Opening outside, but within the range. So this is the example now, trader, that uh, we have the PD value area high. You're above the value area, which is this little area here, right? If this is our value area here, I'm trying to put it. So let's say this is our value area right here, this box. But you open above the value area, but below the range. This is confident, right? But it's not as confident as what? How could you increase the confidence of this open? Totally kept it, it up. It breaks the range. No, no, just the open, no breaking. How? How? What? What other confidence would be better than this one? Open on the previous day's high, right? Opening above the previous day's high would be more confident than this one. If you open here. Yeah, in continuation, yeah. And you don't break the PDH, you continue higher. That's them yeah. accepting prices higher, and they're yeah. not going to look back. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> it's also in your notes. So if you open outside of previous stage, you know, opening outside of the range, if you open outside the PDH or PDL, uh, you cannot break. As long as price does not go back inside previous day range, market accepted the breakout. Okay. Yeah, that does help in, in, in a lot. Oh, this is very important. Yeah, because, I mean, if you know in which direction you're going, it's much better that, uh, how to determine how you can play. Yep. The, uh, when you open outside of the VA, but inside the range, this day can be choppy for some time meaning it does not necessarily need to break immediately to the upside on this type of day as long as you're holding this mm -hmm. pd value area high you're bullish yeah you, you you're not bullish once you break pdh you're bullish as long as you're holding pd value area high as soon as you lose this pd value area high it sets up for a, a downfall to pd value area low that means you were not able to build value higher Therefore, you're most likely going to touch that POC somewhere in between, hopefully on the bottom side of it, and explore the PD value area low, which sets up. This is your 80% rule. Yeah, it's bearish. Your 80% rule, and this is for new people, you want to listen up because it works 80% of the time. Let's say we open here and we crack below the PD value area high, and we are dancing on that line, and you have three, let's say, 10 minute candles close below PD value area high. There's an 80% chance then that you're going to go from here to here. There's an 80% chance as long as you get three 10-minute or five-minute candles, depending on your risk, there's a high chance you're going to visit this value area low. There's a handful of you that you just trade 80% rules in the Discord, and you do pretty well because it has a really, really high chance of working. Okay. And the same is true on the opposite side, right? If you're on a bearish side, open. If you if you want to remain bearish, you cannot reclaim the PD value area low. Here you can lose PD value area high. Here you can't reclaim PD value area low. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Your question here for the eighty percent rule: the entire body of the candle must be, That's you know, inside. The close okay. has to be inside. Yes. The close. Yeah. Okay. It's three five minute candles. Some do five, some do ten. Uh, if you're to ask, let's say, a professional trader would actually wait, you know, because professional institutional traders, they, they don't need a lot of points. They need a handful of points. If they can catch ten, five points every day on 100 contracts, that's plenty. So some of them wait even 15 and 30 minutes on these candles, just so you guys know. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So opening outside, if I was to rank these in terms of confidence, bullish or bearish, this is a really confident market as long as they don't break PDH or PDL. This one here, as long as the PD value area high on the bullish one doesn't break, 
you're bullish. The PDH break during the day is just the icing on the cake. On the opposite side is uh, you know the PD Valeria low and then the PDL, right? That's your scenario. Uh, opening outside, so this one here is opening within value area. These days are usually the ones that you watch for continuation. You need initiative people. You need initiative buyers or sellers, depending on where we are in terms of the context, right? This is, you know, this is where typically you have a slowdown of a trend, and it's exactly what's happening, I would say, uh, right now, right? And if you look here, your, you know, your value areas are stacking a little bit, right? You're not making higher highs yet, because if you look here, you have a lower high, you have a lower high, uh, you have a lower low, you have a lower low, right? So we haven't really changed the trend yet. That's why we say we're framing down still. We need to crack this above here, 47.60. Once you're able to crack this, man, your your story can quickly, quickly go to 48.20. Yeah. Okay. And we just cleaned up, just so you guys know, we are literally at this POC here, at the VPOC. And we have, I would say, we can quickly check how many VPOCs we have. We have a lot of VPOCs below. Here it goes. All the red lines means they're VPOCs that they're most likely going to be retested at some point in near future. And typically, we don't get this many uh, on a run-up like this, but it tells, excuse me, it tells you a lot about the run-up itself. Okay. Is is there anyone confused about the value area and open in relationship to it? it? It's really important you guys have these slides and you can recognize quickly where we are opening. Because it, it's like a piece of a puzzle. Once you have this, you have the date type, you basically eliminated 70% of the problems for your trading. And then you add, you know, a little bit of option, auction type of how we are opening, <laughs> uh, and and it really can solidify your trading. And as long as you practice it, it makes it a lot easier to know who's in control. Is the price being accepted? Is it being rejected? And then you identify the key points, right? Which one can you not go over or under on for your sentiment? Are you guys able to at least start the puzzle? I'm not expecting you to put the puzzle and be accurate 100% right after the class. The idea is to understand the concept after the class. Jody, are you, pardon me, are you recording this? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to have to cut it short, man. I'm, I'm getting into a lot of pain. Sorry, oh, guys. Yeah. Hope you feel better. Feel Thank, better. Thanks a lot for everything, Shorty. You're welcome. I think I'm just starting. I understand to everything up to this point. Everything is real clear. So thank you. You're welcome. Shorty, one question here. How to blend in IBH and IBL? Good. Along good with... So that's a very good question. I left it there to, to open that up uh, kind of with ease, right? So if you look at this, and there's an indicator you guys can actually use for IBH. It's called initial balance. I actually... I, I like it a lot because this highlights this area that you guys see here as initial balance. So if you look here, for instance, how, how would I use this? Right? It's a very good question and the reason why I had it. If you look at this area here, right? So I'm just going to mark my, let me mark the previous day and then kind of remove the profiles. If this is my previous day value area low and this is my previous day value area high, and we'll Put this as a POC here. Okay, we'll put this one as a PD value area low. Just so we have a full story. Okay, and I'm gonna hide it. Okay, so now if you look at this, and I'm gonna go on RTH for simplicity purpose. If if your initial balance day prior was here, which is basically, I would say, covered your value area, most of the time it will be. The next day, you have you have a IB that encompasses the previous day value area as well as the IB. What would that tell you? Wow, that expanded. When when the IB is expanded or value area is expanded. What does it tell you about the participants? They're a lot more active. 
who is active. Um, the uh, um, short-term trader. Short-term, yeah, short-term. When it's a short, when when the when the value area is narrow and IB is narrow, who likes to trade in fair values? Short-term traders. Who likes to trade at the extremes and advantageous prices? Other time frame. Other, Other time, frame. time frame. So if the area was expanded and we closed inside a wide balance IB, do you think it's short-term traders or long-term traders? Long. Yeah. It's always long. When you have a when you have a a, a, sh a narrow IB, that's not a healthy auction. You, when you have a wide balance like this, right? When you have a wide balance, initial balance, what did I tell you about the lamp? So the, I gave them an example of a lamp. Does anyone remember it? The wider the balance, the less chance to get broken. That's correct. So look at this day on, let's say for this day that we had on Friday, the balance is considered huge, 33. How many people shorted the initial balance that said we're going lower? What are we doing? I mean, they, they hopped in with both, with everything they had and they shorted here. Mm -hmm. And how'd that work out? If they were not yeah, quick crash. enough, they, they got destroyed. When you have a wide balance, the odds of that balance getting broken are really, really low. Mm -hmm. When you have a day that has a wide balance like this, it's called what? What type of day is that? I'm segueing into the day types. What type of day is this? Is that open test drive? Don't confuse auction type with day type. So you have auction type and day types. I'm talking about day types. A normal day. Okay. How would you know if it's a normal day? Is that extended typical? Or typical, uh... a trend day. Is it a trend day? No. Mm -mm. Is it a double distribution day? <laughs> okay. Or uh, oh, typical. A typical day. Is it expanded typical? No. It's no, unless it breaks it. Yeah. Ah, there you go, KJ. It's not this one. It's not this one. It's not double. Is it trade range day? Yes. Yeah, could could be, yeah. Could be, but this one was a huge balance. So is it sideways or typical? Typical. Yep. So now, when you know it's a typical day, and let's say you know a typical day and that your IB encompassed the previous day, Meow Cat. I don't, it sounds weird to call you Meow Cat. I might have to change you to something else. M Trader. It just feels awful. I feel like I'm in a Brazers.com. <laughs> I'm so great to identify day types for sure. Yes. That. So now, if you have this, that your IB basically took out your previous day value area high and your value area low and encompassed the whole thing, that tells you somebody else entered the market just now. Uh -huh. It's telling you they're there. And then, of course, how can I validate this? Bean, what do you think? Uh, how do I know that somebody entered the market here? How can I confirm it? Access? Exactly. I can check by access, right? If I go here and now I need to see something on the bottom, right? As soon as it comes up, because it takes its sweet time, if I check here, is there access? Barely. Barely. And that is what I would expect. Why would I expect barely access here? I touched it briefly earlier when I was on eight hour candles. Because we're still in balance Let's or in a range? What kind of node did we have there? Was it a, a major see. node? Do you guys remember when I highlighted the node and I said yeah, that yeah, node? Yeah, yeah. That so node a was small, small yeah. node was there, and it was tiny. Remember, we highlighted it was tiny one, 
So yeah. I didn't expect the volume to be as heavy. I expected whoever is defending that position to just show up there, right? And they showed up just there. <laughs> that was enough. But now, if we are to expect, let's say we lose this, let's say market decides to actually sell off a little bit, 3% down, and they come here, would I expect the access to be heavier here? Certainly. I would expect them to be more aggressive here because there was a longer consolidation. There was more participants here because this range was from here to here, right? Yeah. You're, you're expecting this to be, you know, almost 71 points range. That's pretty good, right? It's a pretty good range they consolidated in. And now, if you think about this, if this was the range here that they also consol consolidated in, and I would say it's equivalent to the range here, and we're dropping. Do you really think this is what we get out of this range, unless it's a trap? Last time they gave us this range, we got a little bit more of a move. We got 3% move. So if they consolidated here and they don't regain this level, let's say, you know, whatever, 47, uh, the value area low, they don't reclaim this quickly tomorrow, then they have the ability to do that drop. So I didn't anticipate the access to be high, and it's not high. Can we count this as access low, considering it has two TPOs? You guys I think we, yeah, it should be, as long as it's two and above. More right? than, no, you need more than. Two or I more, think right? Two or more, so okay. This is market profile, this is two or more, right? So each letter here, if you're new, is there anyone that's never seen market profile, these letters, as we people call them? Is there anyone that... You have or have not? I have, I have not. Okay, good. So if you're new to this, uh, think about this as each letter represents 30 minutes of trading. Where the letter is, it tells you at what price it traded. So A, period, 30 minutes at the open, right? A is the first letter. At the open at 9.30, we started, right? And this here, the little asterisk indicates for this case, indicates the open. We traded here, right? And then we spent the range of 91.75 to 9100 on this uh, coffee commodity. Then the B period, the next 30 minute candles, auctioned higher, 91.75, but it became a selling tail because what? No other letter made a higher high. No other 30 minute candle made a higher high. So this is when you have a single letter, like here, B period, this is called a selling tail or access or access high. That means that there was other participants when we arrived at 9190, uh, they sold off from there. So this is called selling tail and usually indicates you need a little bit of context whether there was other time frame buyers or sellers. In this case on the top, it would be considered other time frame sellers coming in. Okay. On the bottom, you have a buying tail in period I. So you can see the C period stayed inside the B. So this would be an inside candle. If you were to convert this to candles, this would just be a candle that's sitting inside this period. Does that make sense? This is also a candle that has the balance here and a candle is sitting right here. Then you see the D period broke the candle balance of A, B, and C. You guys see that? The yeah. D period is the one, the auction lower than your initial balance. Your initial balance is A plus B, correct? Because 30 minutes is A, the B is another 30 minutes, and our IB is set in the first hour of trading. So the D period started framing down. And then you see the E never framed higher. We never really broke the high back here that initiated the new low. Are you following so far, everybody? Yeah, so each letter represents 30 minutes. That's correct. And then you see here, I'm just going to, let me erase this. Here. Yeah, I took a when I took a break and I was MIA and I came back seeing all these letters. I was like, "Holy crap, this looks confusing!" But it's really no, simple. that's very simple. So now you look here. The price traded at ninety one twenty five. Oh. The, the most times it traded at this level. So it's where did the price spend the most time? At ninety one twenty five. Therefore, it becomes point of control on TPO. Um. So you see the A and B crossed here, C crossed at that level, D crossed, E, F, G, and H. Period I never crossed this level. 
So period I traded where in terms of value? Below it. It traded below the value constantly. G went above and had the shortest range, I would say, from all the periods. Uh, I'm sorry, F had a fairly tight range as well. Because this looked like a really good trap. It never cracked above D here. And now you can calculate, you know, some of us did this manually before. I don't know if Burnside did, but you can calculate the value area based off the number of letters where they traded. And this is the value area where 68% of the time was spent between 91.55 and 90.80. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And in this in this case here, dependent when you know when you start the TPOs, we start at 9:30. Would this be this letter I is your last period in this case? Would this be a spike? Yes. This would be a spike if this is the last period of the day. In our case, just so you guys know, it's M period. N is the closing. It's called the settle period. The settling period is the end period. In this case, it seems like the J was uh, for coffee commodities. So far, is anyone confused? No. OK, so buying tails, these right here that you see, the B, and then you have the I, which is buying tail. This is selling tail. This is indicating that there's some aggression from sellers other time frame sellers meaning not that they trade up people we don't have enough volume to do this and you have buying that also somebody found value you know they started buying here below the value remember big boys buy at advantageous prices they, they don't necessarily want to buy at value and sell here that's me and you two-sided activity we buy here sell here we cover here and here they buy here and they're going to sell here Okay, this is important here. If you have more than two TPOs at top or bottom, means two periods where Wizard but was not able to auction or unfinished auction. If we had a C period here, let's say C period extended all the way up here. Sorry, my drawing is horrible. <laughs> uh, if this was C period here, let's say it's extended all the way to the top. Now, Kat, what would that indicate? The double top. So it, it, it would be a double top or otherwise known as a failed auction. Yep. If you have multiple periods at the top, if you have two letters at the top or the bottom like this, right, that means unfinished auction. Why did the unfinished auction matter? Because if that means was, there's unfinished business. That means unfinished business. That means that they have to come back and resolve it. In an auction, if you ever attended an auction, is there an, ever an auction that there's no winner? If you were to go on a car auction, can that guy auction forever and nobody wins? No. no. He would be fired the next day. When you go to an auction, the, the, the goal of an auction is to do what? It's to sell <laughs> and to buy. Somebody selling a car on the other side, somebody has to buy it. And the way they find the price is how? They start at $5 on the auction. They go 10, 15, 20, comes to 30. The guy goes, going once 30. And let's say, you know, let's say Mr. Bean is a bit at 30 and he's the only guy that raises his hand. And they're like, okay, 35, nobody raises their hand. 35 going once, twice. Remember, they create chaos. And nobody raises their hand. Who won? Mr. Bean. Mr. Bean at 30. So that auction is completed. Right? If he was to sell the same product again, the, the auctioneer, can he start at 30? Would it be a successful auction for him to start at 30? He has to probably go lower to find buyers. If you're an auctioneer, this is a trick question, but a logical question. Let's say this was the price that we were auctioning. And this is the winner, where a winner was, let's say at 9,200 here. Where would you start your next auction from? 
9200 right there yeah same 92. i mean then he accepted the, the highest you price. would start right here at 9200 where it ended no 9300 yeah i'd ask Nine. for more see if there's any buyers yeah then go that come in uh, if there's yeah. not any that's correct if there's not any buyers you could start it here a smart auctioneer if he's selling the same product you know what he would do he would start it where he knows where the buyers were yeah. If I know the highest volume concentration of my buyers for this car is here, I'll hit them one time at 9130. The next buyer is going to immediately, you always have that one person that's like, the price is at $10, they're like 25. And everybody's like, what the fuck? What? We didn't even make two bids yet. From here, you're going to have egos. And in real life, you have a lot of people that are egocentric. They're going to bid out of this trying to win. So they're going to go at 25 and excuse my language. And then the dick measuring contest starts. And then they're like, oh, my God, I'll buy here. And then this guy is at 30. He's like, no, nah, man, I want this at 35. And that's when you when they create euphoria on the market auction. I told you guys I went with my wife to a charity event recently. And um, <laughs> uh, we, we bet on a couple of items, right? And uh, one one guy bid on a, I think it was a ten way ten day vacation or a, a cabin. And I mean, you you can rent a top of the line cabin here in Georgia. I'm talking about like all the bells and whistles on the river, everything for maybe four thousand dollars for a week. This one started at five, right? And it's okay. It's charity, no problem. We'll bid five. It ended up at eleven thousand wow. dollars, and it was the way the auction was done, right? As we started bidding, what do you think they started? This was for kids that suffered from cancer. What do you think the images and videos started showing as we were bidding on this? Yes. Uh, the kids, all the sick kids. Yeah. They started showing all the kids that that you know they're dying and you know they're losing hair. And that sparks a certain emotion for people that are in the bid still. As the auction slowed down, they intensified the videos. And I told my wife, I was like, this is my max bid. I'm not going more than this, right? I'm being rational. I'm willing to help. I'll help them somewhere else. But I'm not willing to pay $11,000 for five days in the cabin. And then she found another item where it was, if you watched Yellowstone, uh, spending a dinner and a... Uh, in the Yellowstone with the, the what's the guy? Cole Hauser? Rip? Uh, rip. <laughs> <laughs> I quickly declined that auction, and I said I'm not bidding on any of that. It started at $10,000 for two nights with Rip. And I was like, well, I might not see my wife after that, so we're not bidding on this one. But that's the same concept of the auctions, right? The auctioneer knows when to hit it, and it's also in the stock market. How come all the good news came out in the stock market when we hit 4,800? Just go back to your news. Go if whatever news media you watch. Every bank said we're in a bull market. Go look. Every single bank expects a bull market to start now. They want retail to buy their shares. <laughs> Guys, these big boys are not going to sell it to each other. They're not stupid. They need individuals to step in. And the only way that you get individuals to do something is to change their feeling. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the live auction that I went to, they put sad stuff. They gave you free alcohol, right? <laughs> <laughs> Emotions go up. You see a lot of sad kids. And of course, I contribute. I'm not, I'm not cheap ass. I gave them $2,500 for a picture. But I'm not willing to give you ten grand for five days. Or with a rip, $10,000 to spend a dinner and yeah, whatever with, with the guy. It's famous, but people bid on, right? And then, of course, you have you have spoofers. I don't know if you, if you has anyone ever been to a car auction or any of it house auction. Have you ever noticed that there's one person that comes out of the gate firing with the with the bids? He's probably fake, right? With He's fake. Yeah, <laughs> he's the guy to initiate the euphoria. He's there immediately raising his number higher higher right and he's a paid actor of the auction to make sure the auction is live and of course if he wins next week on that same auction is the same car because he, he didn't buy it <laughs> that's smart though no it happens all the time 
And same thing in here. I mean, all the banks upgraded. Apple upgraded to 220. NVIDIA's upgraded to 650. Go back. I dare you to spend 20 minutes of your time. Go back in 2006 and 2007. What the news said about the stock market. Amazing. It's the That's same nice. exact stuff that they're telling you right now. What, what about banks? inflation? What about 4140 when we we're coming down? Why didn't they say it was a good time to buy then? Because um, they need to buy the retail shares and scare them. Exactly, the liquidity. If they can't compete with us to buy, they need to buy on their own. <laughs> if they told you to buy, if 100 million people, let's say 10 million people bought three shares of Pfizer, that's 30 million shares, right? How much would be left for them? Right. So the idea is to scare you away so they can buy. And when they're at the top, is to make you feel like you missed something. So you will buy from them while they're selling. <laughs> A lot of people fall for it. But just go check 2006, 2007 September news. You'll see. Any questions on this so far? So initial balance, just to kind of reiterate, initial balance is the first hour. That's your A and B periods. Right, in correlation to value areas, if your IBs are in line with, let's say, previous day IB, with the, with the range, most likely you're going to have just a normal balance day. If the IB, uh, let's say, it's covering like the previous day, it covered the previous day, somebody entered the market, there's a high chance that the day after that you're going to explore higher or lower. And that's where you look at access to see is it on the top or is it on the bottom, meaning selling tail or buying tail. And where we open tomorrow is going to tell us a lot, whether we're going to be bullish or bearish. I already have a question. It's a little, it's not covered on this, and you may cover it in the future. I'm not sure. But the I period's the late spike, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at, they point. say you look for the base of the late spike, that if it doesn't overtake that, we're continuing down. Mm -hmm. That Okay, so in this situation, is the base... 990 or is the base down where we end up getting the d period combined so for me in that in that rule yeah go ahead for me the base spike starts right here okay some people play base spikes off of single prints right okay. you can consider this to be the base spike here because right? you got like four periods you don't want to pick it up where it actually exactly. starts right. yeah Okay. I, right. I count from here. This is me. This is just uh -huh. shorty. The way I play it, I would count here. You have the books. If you look at Steidelmeyer, right? If you read his book, if this is our value area low right here, this is where he would start on the break of the value area was the base start. This is good. As long as like you see this period here is all single prints and D period. They went five low. Mm -hmm. You can start this here typically. Because if mm -hmm. it's a typical day and then you explore and you expand the IB in this case, which probably is somewhere, you know, IB is here and your value mm -hmm. area is lower. So you broke the IB, but you stayed relatively close to it. So if you break the value area, that's considered a spike in the last period. But mm -hmm. if this one had, uh, let's say, an E here, I'm trying my best to draw it. If it had E here, three mm -hmm. E's here and only two D's here. I could not count this as a spike start here. Okay. For me, it would be more. Bring it down to there. Okay. Exactly. So basically, if it's two, I, you can count it. Once exactly. it goes above two, it's kind of like, no, at the base, you've got to start there. Yeah, exactly. That's how I look at it. And it, it oh, works okay. for me, right? And it doesn't mean it's the right or wrong way. Uh, Peter looks at the value area, right? Mm -hmm. But I would say a lot changed since Peter wrote the book or right. invented the method. Okay. Yeah. Any any other question? That's a very good question. Okay. I'll add something to this. There's something a settled price. Does anyone know what the settled price is? CK, if you know, just ignore a question. Uh Day candle close. At what time? Uh, 4 p.m. 
Four fifteen is the settle price. Fifteen. You know you can trade spy and SPX till four fifteen if it's not zero day. You guys know that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Options too. Yeah. yeah, options you can trade till four fifteen if it's not zero DT. Your zero DT settles at four cash on SPX. Right. A spy is different, basically. You have to have shares. But 415 is your settle price. The the reason why I bring this up, I brought it up to you guys about you guys remember the inventory? What we talked about not too long ago about inventory being short or long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so overnight inventory plays a role based on the settle price, right? So if you guys have I would say if if you settle the price of so let's say 4500 and overnight we are well above 4500 everything traded about 4500 it is believed that overnight inventory is what net long net long if you're trading at that level what is it like 45 it's basically balanced there's no positioning an overnight session and why is that important is because you have the markets are 24 7 it's globex right i mean everybody's trading it's the most liquid piece of investment in, uh, vehicle in, in the world the yes and then q right so they're trading and that positioning is important it's important to know this because if the net inventory is long right now let's say you come back from net inventory and we open 9 30 comes in and they start selling why do you think they will start selling at open they want to liquidate the weak hands exactly they want to liquidate those overnight longs and if there's a poc below in that area that becomes a very good spot to go long because all those people that just got liquidated right they're most likely going to have a stop loss somewhere once they close their longs <laughs> and you come to that poc what do you think the cash session does buy it up. they're gonna buy it up Right, they took the weak hands out, and the same is true if you're net short. If you're spending a lot of time below settlement close below the price, that means you're short. So that's why now I'm gonna ask you: Can you see how <laughs> uh, the auction type open can integrate into this? If you have a POC that's at the bottom and that inventory was net long. When we open, we can sell off from the bot from the top where the inventory was long. We can test drive. We can come and test the POC and auction higher. Wouldn't that be an open test drive? Yeah. Yeah. And same can be said if, if it's vice versa, right? If it's bearish. I see, I see what you mean now. Like when you said um, uh, the next day they start the auction back off at the POC. Yeah, they, they can kick it off. They test the POC, and that would be, an, it would be an open test drive. We test the level, and we drive again. We go in the direction that we want it to. Okay. So does everybody understand the inventory? Do I need to add a specific slide to it so you guys can maybe remember it? If you can, that would be great. Yeah, I'll yeah, add I hate to ask. No, it's not a big deal. I have it in my head. That's why. <laughs> so like I asked my father-in-law, I'm like, hey, when are we going to build this uh, fire pit? He's like, I have it in my head. And I'm like, oh, great. Well, I don't have it in my head. And I can't visualize it. So no, I, I, got, a, I, I got a question on this one, too. I've mm -hmm. heard from a couple different people how they do it. and Some people are doing like one minute on that opening candle for the drive. For determining the high and low of the candle mm -hmm. for the bounce retest, or uh, depending on if it's good holding long or short, what time period do you like to take? On the that? opening period is 30 minutes. Mm, I open. mean, the, the, uh, do you do an opening candle with the with the opening drive? I do all? one. I do one minute. Mine one is minute. always that's, one minute. Okay. Yeah, that, that's the what candle is one minute. Yeah, I do that okay. one minute high and low, and that that tells me, you know, how are you. Position, how are you doing on that? Oh, hello? Yeah. Can you guys yeah. hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear yes, you. Yes, we hear you. Uh, something happened. I lost my screens for a second. Oh. I don't know. Did it blink for you guys or no? No. Just me. No. Oh. Okay. And 
you guys will laugh when you find out what happened with my internet, but I'll save that for the last. Uh, one yes, of the kids I, I looked that. at one. <laughs> no, I wish it was the kids. Uh, um, so I, I do look at the one minute, but for the 30 minutes, when I establish what kind of drive to reconfirm, I, I need to make sure that the 30 minute low, the high, were not taken out to validate those auction types. Right. So if we had a PDH, let's say above, let me go there. <clears throat> so initial balance high, is everybody okay with this? Is there anyone that's not? It's your first one hour, right? Uh, there are certain rules about IBH, and we can cover this in more detail, where it gives you 88% chance that it's going to work. And that actually, I would say it, it works a lot, a lot of times, right? Because it does have a 88% chance. If you spend time above IBH, if you spend, let's say, three five-minute candles above the IBH, after 10.30, then the 88% chance that the low of the days has been set. Can you, does everybody understand that? Mm. And same is true for opposite. If you spend, you know, three, five or 10 minute candles, whatever your risk is or, you know, how, how probable you want to be, if you spend it below IBL, then the setting of IBH, the high of the day is set 88% of the time. So the way you can play this, let's say in the first case, if we are above IBH and we know the low of the day has been set and you're coming to the low of the day, let's say, or you're coming to a closer to the POC that's close to the low of the day, that would be a very good long because there's an 88% chance that you're going to get a bounce from there. You just have to determine if there's a high volume node in the area or you can take the IBL if it comes very low to the low of the day that minimizes your risk because you can put the risk a couple of ticks or points below the low of the day and you can enjoy the long. And that was similar what kind of what happened on <clears throat> Friday. Okay. If the IB is wide, you have to keep that in mind. If the IB is super wide, more likely you're going to trade inside that IB for the rest of the day. Hmm. Okay. And if the price opens above previous day value and IB is formed higher than PD value, this is a bull sentiment. Same is true for opposite. Somebody asked, how do you use them? If we are trending above the IBs or below, uh, it, you know, and, and I'm not saying you're consolidating at those levels, but you're breaking them, it's best to go with that trend of the initial balance. It's not always the case because there's anomalies, right? But if we are breaking the IB, we are doing an extension on the IB, most likely it's the best for you to proceed uh, in that direction. Okay. Uh, here I give you some examples, right? Uh, I don't know why this I just went, it went on my different screen. Um, I don't know how to change back. So. Uh, if you guys look here, can, is this big enough for everyone? So if you guys look, TPO, that's the two, and you guys have this PowerPoint, just so you know, uh, two TPOs at the top that initiates a failed auction. And so it's going to have to be resolved. They have a high probability to be fixed when you're in a D shape. When you're in a trend, they, they, they don't necessarily have the same high probability of being fixed. If this is a D shape, it has a really high chance of being resolved. Uh, if it's one TPO on the bottom, that's also considered a poor low in this case, not poor high, and they are most likely to be resolved and refixed like they were here. Okay, there's something called a halfback. Does anyone remember what that is? Fifty percent back to the middle of the 50, year. Yeah, it's the fifty percent of the range of that day, right? And typically, you want to see some halfbacks. Uh, uh, if you start seeing too many halfbacks in a trend day, that means the trend, day, trend is slowing down a little bit, right? So you want to pay attention to the halfbacks because it's the 50% of the previous day's range. Jordy, okay. when you say um, you have a poor high or poor low and it needs to be fixed, does that, that you, you're meaning that uh, the price needs to return there? That's correct. It needs to return there because, for instance, in this example here, uh, if you look, so this was our poor high here, right? If this price, uh, where is it? If this price was to auction, let's say we went higher than this POC because that was the sentiment there. If we went higher here, high odds were that we were going to then fix this here. Okay. 
we would that would be your target above the POC. You would have the value area high for a trim. You keep your runners till you clean clean up this failed auction at the top. Because remember, in the auctions, you got to have a clear winner at some point. Here, and you you basically will need sellers to be done selling, and here as well, uh, you will need somebody to finally stop selling here and you buy it. And here, you need people to stop buying. Does that make sense? Yeah. You need a clear winner on both sides. Okay. Here, can you the, repeat that last one? Say it again. Can you repeat that last thing you just said? Yeah. So you, you definitely need, when, when you're going higher, you're looking to shut off what? Buying. You need to stop buying. So there needs to be a clear winner at the buying, right? And when you're, when you're selling, you're looking to sell, when you're going lower, what are you looking to sell off, to shut off what? Selling. You need to shut off the selling. So there needs to be a clear winner on the bottom as well. You need to have on the footprints, you would have a zero uh, on side here and a zero on the top. If you have two numbers on them, and then we'll get there shortly, on the footprints, if you have numbers that are like, let's say 39 and five, that means a failed auction. Here it's two TPOs. When you have a failed auction, let's say in this scenario here, we reclaim this POC here and a halfback. I would target the value area highs of the two days to be the first target. But ultimately, if you crack this level that's sitting right there, the magnet would be that they resolve this failed auction at the top. Failed auctions get to revisit it to be cleared soon. Because you always need a, you know, a completed auction. They aim for that. A, a completed auction signals an end to end trend and a shift to the opposite side, just like we did with the car. If you completed the auction, the auction ended, then you have to go in the opposite direction somewhere. Okay. This leads into the date types. This is fairly important, just like the value area, the four scenarios in the value area. Uh, we have, I would say, five day types, right? So you have the normal days, right? Uh, entire range day is set uh, in the first period. This is your IB. Typically, normal days are the ones that, that we get to experience until then you, you shift normally here in a normal variation here in the trend day. Okay. This is, I would say, a lot of times, this is where market uh, spends between these three here. Double distributions, they tend to show lack of confidence on both ends, right? Because uh, they create a HVN on one side and they are unable to crack above and they bring it back below and they accumulate. On the normal days, there's no range extensions, right? They are brief and they quickly reverse to IB. You guys can definitely find this lately on it. Uh, wide initial balance and that balance is not broken. So I covered just moments ago, I gave you an example of that. So if you guys look, uh, let's see, let's go on. So if you guys look here, this was your initial balance here. I'm just gonna look at the initial balance here. Initial balance was set in the first hour, right? And it was 33 points, right? And the whole day range was how much? 40 points. What's 33 divided by 40? Anyone? Anyone fast enough? Around I don't know, is it like 75? Yeah. Should be about, I would say, uh, I don't know, 83%. Eighty two and a half. And we are basing this that it should be about eighty five percent of the range set. So this tells you this is in, in, in terms of days, this is a normal day. Wider the balance, the harder the break to hence normal days tend to stay within the balance. Who is in control? Short term trader. Always short term. On a normal variation, and I'm, I'm not switching back and I can find every single one. You guys should be able to visualize this. IB, the date type, and the range. You guys should be able to literally see it. <laughs> As you close your eyes, you can visualize every one of these. Range extensions occur during the first half of the day. Balance is not as wide as normal days. 
So this day here, there's an example right last week. Uh, it, it looks like a normal day, but it's not nearly as wide. Balance to unbalance and then adjusted balance. So that means that we break the extensions, right? They occur on both sides and we expand it, but we don't necessarily close above it. On most extreme normal variation day, the IB roughly doubles the initial balance. That means you come to the IB, twice the IB, but you don't go beyond that. And then you fall back inside and you stay there uh, outside the IB. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If extension is excessive, long-term is control. Usually this is 50-50. Okay. Initial Can we balance... picture normal variation like a double distribution? No. You can't. So it would look like more like, let's see. So if you look at this one here, right? Uh, pay attention to this here. This IB here was, I would say, 33. Mm -hmm. Picture this one right here. This one is 20. That's a, that might not seem like a big difference to you, but it's a huge difference. Right, so we broke the IB here, right? You see how we spent time above it here? Yeah. We spent the time above it. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to close above it, but look what happened then. You went, and did you spend any time anywhere else? Bottom. Yeah. You extended both of them, and you closed below it. On this day here, on a wide balance, where did you close? In between. You closed in between. In between. Yeah. between. Just normal variation and a normal day. Normal day, you close inside. Okay. You close inside here. You close outside. As long as the IB is not beyond 2x. And this little cool indicator, you can do the 2x. Got how. Uh, ah, here it goes. So here, for instance, in this day, this is the 2x. In order for this to be a trend day, we would need to go beyond 2x. Yeah. Usually, probability of us going, you know, 3x of an IB is the odd. I think that chances are like 7%, so not very high. But as long as you're inside here, that's considered normal variation. And as long as you close in between, that's normal variation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's this one here. Most extreme normal variation, you stay inside, divided. Normal trend day, initial balance is not wide, and typically we have access within the first periods. This is important to identify as a trend day. You're above the 2x and you're going market moves in one direction and close that directional extreme. Meaning if you're going higher, that you're closing above that POC, if it's a P shape or lowercase b, if you're bearish. <clears throat> and typically, that's the third to last bullet, typically five or less TPO wide. Can everybody visualize this? What does this mean? Does anyone not know what it means? It's a little tough to visualize. Oh, like you saying that excessive? It's not like not that much. No, I want. It's that like one. a it's like a D day maybe, and just we're at the POC and a range day, kind of looking. I don't know. I Sorry. That's okay. I'll, I'll, I'm going to give you guys an explanation. It's going to make sense in 15 seconds. All right. Five TPO wide. Okay. So we're just going to hide this guy first. No, not this guy. This is our TPO, right? Everybody agree. This is your TPOs. So on the bottom, we have one TPO. Here we have two TPOs. One, two, one, two, three, four TPOs. How wide is this TPO? One, two, three, four, five. This one is six. This one is seven TPO wide. So this one is seven. This one is eight. And we're going to hide this fella here so I can see these colors. So now you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight periods wide. And this one says on a normal trend day, you should never concentrate <laughs> that much time at a certain level. Because if you're concentrating on time, that means you're building value. 
when you're trading, when something is aggressive, they're rejecting the value, they're going higher. They should not spend a lot of time at these points. Remember, when you're bullish, they're not going to spend a lot of time. When you see a P-shape profile, let's see, let's find one. I'm just going to make this a little bit smaller. Let's go four because it can give us a better. P-shape check from days. Yeah, December 13th will be the one. Okay, so let's take a look at what is this, December 20th. One. And this one is, if you look at it, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven at the top. And then typically, if you have that many at the top, that means you concentrate too much, you, you get a little bit of punishment and you get a pullback. Let's look for one that's like a true P shape somewhere. If we have one, <laughs> everything's been, uh, December has been the awkward month. Uh, this is consolidation. Let's look at this one here. So you have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and look what happens. Did they go down from here? <laughs> Does that make sense? Why? Yeah. If you're spending too much time at a level, that means you're accepting that value there. When you're in a bullish trend, when you're in a trend day, should you stop a lot or should you be just continuing making higher highs and higher lows with emotional buying occurring? Just continue. You should Use continue. You should continue and the value should catch up with what? Well, you should catch up the price. The price. Well, you should up. catch up the price. So that's why you don't want to spend too much time creating value elsewhere. Right. Uh, when you have this long term is in control, that's considered an imbalanced market, right? This is more balanced. This is balanced to imbalance. And this one is, this goes balanced to imbalance as well. Uh, this is similar. So you can have a double distribution that's a trend day, right? You guys have seen me or heard me, I'm sorry, say, you know, we are, we have a double distribution day, but be careful, for instance, this one here seems to be kind of like a double distribution. You have skinny belly, skinny here, right? You have single prints in between here and here, right? So the way you treat this is this is one distribution here. Oh, sorry. Like this is one distribution here. And then you have a distribution lower. And each one of these is going to have a POC and a value area, right? So if you're able to, let's say the price auctions through these single prints here and they close here, that means the price is being rejected from the top and the lower distribution here is being accepted, most likely you're gonna continue lower. As soon as you break that value area low, you can expect uh, the crack to continue. So these single prints here in this case are the division between price acceptance higher and lower. Okay, make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Everyone following? But if, let's say, we closed above this high volume node that's sitting right here, the heart of it, that's where I say you want to be careful shorting this because this usually can cause a major, major spike. And same intraday as well, right? And see here, if you look at it, if you go below this, you can continue much lower because that means that the confidence when you have a B, right? When you think about this. So we had confidence we are here now. Oh, never mind. Well, let's go lower and look for value. There's no market confidence to continue. Market confidence is the best when you're just going higher, high, higher lows or lower, high, lower lows. When you're stuck in between, this is indecisive, I would say, market auction. It's not very clear. So you can have a bullish one as long as you close above the higher volume node, higher distribution, or a bearish one if you close on the bottom half of that distribution. So this one can have a double distribution trend day or a bearish trend day. Bullish or bearish. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Neutral days, uh, these are tough. Uh, this is where a lot of people, um, this is a trapping uh, profile, right? Where, where you have a range extension of both ends. They cancel a lot and reproduce the auction between extremes. This is really no confidence at all. Uh, long people are not involved at all, and this range uh, is much smaller than a normal day, right? 
So this is how you can classify this. And as soon as you see this, it's the best to kind of turn off your monitor and just go away. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. I add some notes here. This covers the, I think we covered this initiation where people are in terms of buying and selling. Uh, TP account, I honestly would not worry about it. I do not use it at all. I just added it in case anyone had interest in it, how to count the TPOs and how to differentiate in balance days, who's in control, long-term, short-term. I, I wouldn't say you guys need that. It would create more confusion. Uh, Shorty, really quick before you uh, proceed, um, for that last thing you talked about for the range extension, so you're looking at the first hour initial balance and you're looking for the range to be extended both ways, like within the next hour after that, or like at all. The yeah. top or the top? You, you make a conclusion on the day after the day is done. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And typically these are very nasty days and uh, you can identify them, like for instance, here. Like um, this is, I guess this was half day. So let me turn on the candles. You can find it here shortly. It's always like that. Yeah. So for instance, look at this day here, 21st. You see how you went above, <laughs> you went below, and you closed, I would say, deadly on to that POC here. Well, maybe not, but definitely 50%. <laughs> You close right pretty much at 50% there at the half back of it. Typically, so, you're, mm -hmm. you're going to close there unless it's an extreme close, but I would never consider on a tight, narrow range like that anything extreme. If it's a wide balance, like we did Friday, you have a wide balance and you're closing at the upper half of the value area, high or low. Those are extreme closes on a neutral day. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that slide that you were talking about, about the various kind of days, you're not really looking to make uh, like a judgments within no. the day as it's developing. You're looking at it after. after for the, the day types, yes. Because I can use, for instance, this day type here. Uh, I can use this. Let me say, watch this. On this day type here, what would you consider this to be? What type of day is this? Uh, neutral variation. Neutral. Okay. On profile, on volume profile, what type of day would you guys say this is? Maybe a lowercase b. I say lowercase b. I'd say a d. D. More like. Well, it just looks more like a, I would say, like a d shape, right? It has a pretty good distribution here. The worst case, you can consider it a double distribution, but it's not really clean, I would say, right? On RTH, it's not clean double distribution. Here's your. ETH. This looks like a perfect, I would say, D shape. Distribution nicely concentrated in the middle, right? SKU is right in the middle as well. So this is definitely a D shape on the day. And you close right at the POC. So what what insight do we have about tomorrow or Monday? So yeah, tomorrow. We're closed on the fifty percent, so it's most likely we'll go lower. Okay. And if they quickly reclaim this POC, can you stay bearish? Oh um, no. No, this is going to be a bullish setup, right? If they gap up tomorrow, which I think they will, uh, just uh, intuition here, if they gap up tomorrow, they can potentially test this poor high at the top. Right. So this is a D shape. I use it after the fact. If I see the initial balance, that's why I use an initial balance intraday. If I see that, you know, let's say tomorrow we open an initial balance is seven points, like we've had some, like let's say it's this much, it's 13 points. Well, I anticipate that we're going to have a breakout of the initial balance, and I can go with the flow of the initial balance. In this case, let's say this is the initial balance tomorrow, and they crack this to the upside. I can see the probabilities working in its favor because they don't have much until the poor high and fixing that and the some high volume notes. That's how I would use the day types, right? In this case that, that we're currently in. You're in a D shape, you're closed neutrally. I mean, you're right at the POC. If you close, let's say they didn't have the spike. Let's say they close somewhere here, right? In this range, that, that would be a slightly different story. You're in a D shape and you're neutral bearish. If they closed somewhere at the high end, let's say here, that would be neutral bullish, right? It's a neutral day with a bullish sentiment. 
and I would expect them to continue on Monday. So here's a little bit of a neutral, but the reclaim of the value area low and how aggressive they got there is what's leaning me that they're going to try to push this tomorrow. And I don't know if they have news or if anything's scheduled, but that's just my sentiment. That no news till Wednesday. So here's your range extensions, if anyone's wondering. This explains them. It has a bunch of questions uh, before I release the quiz. If you guys have time, maybe read through it again. Uh, opening range types, this covers the four types. So you have five day types, and then you have four auction types, right? Uh, it, it's good to know them and to be able to visualize them. And then you also have four types of value areas and opening types compared to the value areas. So four value areas, five day types, and uh, four open drives. I did start something here. I'm not nearly done. I'm going to create a PowerPoint that's 100% focused on open market profile and simplify it much more than what you see here and give you a little bit more examples on how you can trade it. So I say we park it here because it's 3 o'clock and I'm honestly exhausted from talking for four hours. We can cover the open drives here. And then we would cover the footprints probably Saturday. This Saturday, we'll schedule something 10, 11 a.m. And that would conclude bringing you guys up to speed on volume profile. And then we cover the market profile. Then, and, and throughout the week, you would see it actually live and what it means. And you start putting the puzzle and pieces if you're new together. And then Saturday, we'll conclude with the footprint charts. We'll share the quant tower. I had it ready, but um, I guess we just had a little bit of discussions, right? That took a little bit longer. And we'll cover the footprints, and we'll cover, we cover the volume profile and the market profile. And then you'll have the three components and what we use uh, in the Discord. And then, of course, we reiterate some of the other stuff as well. So I say let's stop here. Uh, if you guys can, kind of if you have questions, ask me, send me, or in the chat if others can benefit from it. And then let's get ready for next session on Saturday to complete the footprint charts, which will give you guys the order flows, the deltas, and then, you know, how do you know this level of like volume profile or how did you know that 4,700 was going to come out and people are going to come out firing? You're able to see some footprints, completed auctions, the, the aggression of the buyers, kind of the x-ray of the candles. Once you combine those pieces, it really creates, I would say, a powerful combo in trading. And then I will show you guys on Quantaro how I use the delta charts instead of volume profile to know where to look liquidity uh, resides in the intraday levels as well. So that's what I would focus on next class. And probably sometimes this week, maybe even tomorrow night, we do a stock search scan uh, for Q1. How's that? Anyone, any objections? That sounds good. That sounds Thank awesome. Good. Okay. Sounds All right, guys. Well, Thank you guys for the time. Hopefully you guys picked up something and I'll see you guys. Uh, I'll probably do a nine tonight just to prep for the market because I didn't prepare anything yet. Uh, let's do 9 p.m. prep for the market, 15 minutes uh, for the rest of the week. Uh, and then let's go from there. And Monday, tomorrow, we can do a stock search, 30 minutes. We'll find the stocks for portfolio long term. Thank you, Shorty. All right. Have a good one. See you guys. Thank you, Shorty. Thank you. Bye-bye.